is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This is episode number 448. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your Limited Resources. And joining me once again all the way from Barcelona, Spain, via the United States of America and via Australia somehow, <laughs> it's the Ben Sack. TBS, what's going on, buddy? Hey, I guess I have lived on a lot of continents. You really have. <laughs> I, I was uh, mentioning, I, uh, one of my family members asked, well, who did you do the show with? And I said, oh, I have my friend Ben come on. And oh, where did you meet him? Oh, you know, through Magic World. Whatever. Oh, where's he from? I'm like, well. <laughs> <laughs> it's I'm, a little complicated. <laughs> yeah, it, there's a bit of a history there. Uh, yeah, you, you have uh, been around the world, not just uh, from traveling for Magic, but also where you've lived. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I've tried to always uh, live in places where there's a lot of sunshine. So Barcelona makes three of those because I uh, grew up uh, in Australia, in Sydney. So there was always sun there. And then um, I was lived in California, and so I've kept up that uh, by moving to Barcelona. So there's great food and a lot of sun, which is nice. So what are, are you? Are you uh, European at heart, American at heart, or Australian at heart? Oh, that's that's don't make me choose. <laughs> I, 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 I I think my heart is Australian. Okay. My head is American. Okay. And my stomach is European. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I love it. <laughs> so we brought TVS back on, of course, because this week we are jumping right back into the set review process here. This is how we do it over on LR. We run through every single card in the set in depth so that you have a good fundamental starting point on where to go. And this is going to be the M19 Rare and Mythic Rare set review show. We're going to be getting into all those in just a minute. Before we do, though, I want to remind you that this show is brought to you in large part due to you via the Patreon. And thank you so much for supporting us over the Patreon. Uh, it can be a tricky business sometimes. And uh, you know what? It's really great to know that our supporters are always there for us. Uh, and that is the way to do it most directly. Uh, Patreon.com slash limited resources. You get a bunch of cool bonuses uh, for different levels. And uh, thank you. Seriously appreciate any, each and every one of you, no matter how much, uh, as long as you've gone over there, uh, we, we really, really, really thank you for that. Um, I'm going to go over the grading scale overview. One little tips and tricks here, by the way, for longtime LR listeners will know this, but maybe you don't. Uh, if you feel like you're really comfortable with our grading scale, I actually put in the show notes uh, when we start each color. So, you know, I, it won't hurt my feelings if you want to skip ahead. I just like to go over the grading scale overview for people that are newer to the show to let them know an idea of where we're starting and how these grades work because uh, you, we could apply kind of whatever we wanted to these grades, but we're happy with the way we do it. So let's get right into that. A, we're going to be seeing a good amount of A's today. They're bombs, game winners. They're good in many situations, especially when you're behind. They're the best cards in the set. And sometimes they're also hyper-efficient removal spells, cards like Lyra, Siege Gang Commander, and Multani. B's, B's are cards that actively pull you towards that color. They're often kind of these headlining cards for the set. Uh, they're the, you know, like for the mechanic, they're the go-to cards. And the reasons to be in a color or a clan or a guild or whatever. Um, also, most solid removal falls, uh, falls into the B range. Wizards, Lightning, Wrath, Capuchin, the Eldest Reborn cards like that. Cs are your solid playables. You're right in the middles. The pawns of limited. They're pretty interchangeable. Uh, you do need some amount of these for your deck. And oftentimes your deck is mostly made up of Cs. Also, kind of mediocre removal often fits in the C. Uh, grade, Yavamaya, Sapherd, Academy, Drake, Deathbloom, Thalid, Fiery Intervention, cards like that. Uh, interestingly, rares and mythic rares lends itself to not very many Cs. We won't be seeing a ton of those. Uh, Ds are sometimes playable, but you'd prefer to not run them. They're kind of mediocre to junky cards. Maybe they're a little situational uh, or they have a high setup cost. Um, they'll make the cut, but you won't be thrilled with it. And usually kind of the bad end of removal ends up being here as well. Cards like Cabal, Evangel, Keldon, Warcaller, Opt, uh, Arbor, Armament, cards like that. Fs are your unplayable in virtually all scenarios. These are extremely narrow cards that fit in this category. Or with extreme mana cost, you know, if it costs 14 mana, you're, you're just, it's not really castable and limited no matter what it does. And so you're not going to end up playing it. Cards like Curator's Ward and Damping Sphere. Under almost all circumstances, you just don't play Fs. Sideboard cards, well, we know what that's for. This is a separate category because 
if you bring it in in the right situation, it could be a B or an A. But generally speaking, it starts off in your sideboard cards like Pierce the Sky, Broken Bond, and Radiating Lightning. And then, of course, we also have build arounds. Now, we won't see too many sideboard cards in Rare and Mythic Rares, but we very well may see some build arounds. These are cards that are typically not good enough on their own. In fact, sometimes they just do nothing. They could be an F on their own. But if properly built around, they can be all stars. Cards like the Antiquities War, Lich's Mastery, and even Sage of Latnam if you got enough artifacts in Dominaria. So that's it. Uh, again, you will see a little more polarization on the grades than we did before. The uh, commons and uncommons tends to group around the C, D, and B range. And the rares and mythics actually tend to be in the A's and D's and F's. Uh, they actually go to the, to the end. So we're going to start with red once again. And our first card is called Alpine Moon. It's red for an enchantment at rare. It says when it enters the battlefield, choose a non-basic land card name, lands your opponent's control with the chosen name, lose all land types and abilities, and they gain tap, add one mana of any color. Speaking this is a constructed something. Yeah. Right? Speaking of polarizing, this is a very, very clear F. Um, yes. It's, you know, this this really almost no uh, application in... In, no. in limited so um this is an easy f there's not even a time i'd sideboard it in so no f for alpine moon next is called apex of power it costs seven red 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 for a sorcery this is a 10 mana mythic rare sorcery tbs so <laughs> boy i you know if i just told you that i mean the bar has to be I mean, the translation on the text has to roughly say you win the game. Yeah, right? I mean, even even if it did, I you know, I, I, let's say it was like yeah. red, 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 <laughs> seven, win the game. I don't think it's actually generally playable, but there might be situations okay. you brought it in. But anyway, let's continue with this card. Okay, so it says exile the top seven cards of your library until end of turn. You may cast non-land cards exiled this way. If a spell was cast from your hand, Add 10 mana of any one color. <laughs> All right, whatever. This is just an F, right? Apex of Power is just too... Like, I get it. You're playing your commander deck. You're going to do something insane. But come on, we're not doing this. I mean, we aren't. Uh, I'll, I'll be pretty clear here. I would like... Don't get me wrong. I, I'm sure you'll see people try. And this is actually mm -hmm. kind of close to you in the game. It's very... It's really powerful, okay? <laughs> like, I, I think... I mean, you get the mana back straight away. So in some ways, it's not like... You didn't waste it. The the only opportunity. Wait, it's free. I mean, it's ba it's basically free, but I mean, you're, you're, <laughs> with a very large down payment. There's yeah. a very very large down payment. I mean, look, I, I don't think you should really ever um, play this. I can, I guess there will be some matchups I might consider aborting, but almost you know not in any general application. So I'm going to call this an F. Yeah. But uh, I, I I think you'll see this cast more than a, like a zero amount of times actually in like even you know i i actually think you on on a feature match you might even see this get cast if someone got a little tricky after after sideboarding yeah maybe in sealed or whatever apex of power gets an f next is no oh, this is a good combo card with it banefire uh banefire's back it's at rare and it's an x spell it's an x burn spell with Sick artwork from Raywin Swanland on it. It is a red X sorcery. It does X damage to any target. And if X is five or more, this spell can't be countered and the damage can't be prevented. So this is, I mean, this Ooh, is an good. A plus. I, I, I think um, X spells have always been very close to A or A plus here. In this case, it's about as efficient as you can um, hope for. Uh, like, and and the, and the thing is to remember is the reason why it's good is because it's flexible. You can kill a creature, you can kill your opponent, um, and so it don't actually be too afraid of like using it on a crucial um, like threat. But obviously, it doubles as just completely ending the game, especially at like you know numbers of like six and seven and eight. Yeah, and it, that's really part of the hidden power of a card like Banefire is that you can use it early on their cheap creature to keep yourself alive if you need to, but it becomes its own game plan at some point where you you know you get your opponent down to eight and you start making sure you hit your land drops and then you just can attack with everything, get them down to four or five, and then just boom, kill them with your Bane Fire. I would give it an A minus. Uh, the reason why I'm not quite as high on it is because it is hard to make it uh efficient right it's sorcery speed removal that's always basically or often a mana behind whatever it is that you're killing and so that makes it not great as far as like 
you know, like lightning strike is a more efficient way or whatever to kill a creature. But and, and main fires, of course, is sorcery. But the fact that it can just straight up end the game and that you can build your whole plan around it definitely bumps it up for me into the upper echelon. So I would say A minus. You're saying A, A plus for main fire? Yeah, but only only because I think that the the format is also a bit slow, and so mm. games games are going to get ended by the X part of it a lot. Okay, yeah, Banefire is nice. Uh, next is Dark Dweller Oracle. This one is one and a red for a two two Goblin Shaman at rare, and you know Goblin is a relevant creature type in M nineteen, so let's not overlook that. And has an activated ability. One, sacrifice a creature, exile the top card of your library. You may play that card this turn. And just for a reminder, you still pay the costs. You can play a land this way only if you have an available land uh, play remaining, meaning that you need to use your land drop on it. But you can use, you can play lands as well. Yeah. I mean, th this card is pretty mediocre. I mean, I like there, there are situations where um, you may use it, like if you actually um, need something to win the game or mm -hmm. like you get in desperation mode. The, the the biggest problem with actually like sacrificing as a cost here is let's say someone kills something on their turn or dies in combat. Mm -hmm. um, like a lot of times it's, I don't know, you, you, you're not in a position to really plan for this. Like you, you, you're going to do it kind of, you know, either they do it on their turn or in combat. And so you've already kind of like made some plans about what you're doing. And so it's actually really, really difficult to you know, consistently get as, get it as a source of card advantage. I think it's actually um, just a little clunky. I mean, the, the opportunity cost of playing it is pretty low. It's a it's a bear. It's it you know it'll, it'll be serviceable. You probably played most red decks you you have, but I think it's really hard to get a huge upside. Feels like that to me too. I think the thing to not overlook is that sacrifice a creature aspect of it. That is steep. That that is yeah. th that is not the kind of cost that you go. Oh, whatever. It's just no. That 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 is a board affecting gamble that is hard to take. That said, boy, it's a two two for two. That's a goblin with this upside that is really pretty nice i mean I, you know sure you might not want to just it's not like it just ends the game when it comes down but if i told you that this was like a very complicated common you'd be quite happy with it right you'd be like oh it's a it's a bear with upside i like those you know so to me dark dweller oracle you know is probably like a c plus uh i don't think that you're going to be just willfully activating this but look active treasons in this set this is just another way that you can sacrifice to that um, there's a bunch of the, you know, when you, when a creature dies, something happens. There's a few of those. I, I feel like Dark Dweller Oracle is just going to be kind of solid. It's just, we have to kind of adjust away for the fact that it's a rare. Yeah. I mean, and that's why I say C, I, I, like, I, I think a bear with upside is, you know, a C, maybe a C plus, but I mean, yeah. a bear is still, yeah, you know, mediocre stats. Okay. Dark Dweller Oracle CC Plus. Next is Demanding Dragon. <laughs> That's a great name. Three red red for a, oh my God, five five flying dragon at rare. When it enters the battlefield, it deals five damage to target opponent unless that player sacrifices a creature. My God. <laughs> so obviously the stats, like the vanilla test, I guess, or the uh, French vanilla test yes. for, this, for this creature is excellent. Mm -hmm. Five mana, five five flyer. If it did nothing else, it would still probably be a B plus. Um, this, yeah, B plus eight minus range, right, right. right. Mm -hmm. And 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 now with with that ability, I mean, it's not nothing. It's it kills either the worst creature on the table or um, the opponent takes five. I mean, obviously, there's some situations where they have a six stuffness creature, and so sorry, no, no, no sorry, actually, I, I thought it did damage to the creature. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if the the creature on the board is like too good, then they'll do five damage. Um, but I think you know. This is re like solid A and maybe even A plus because the upside is pretty high. Yeah, I have I have demanding dragon at A. Uh, the 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 baseline is insane as you mentioned, and seasoned players like you and I, Ben, will know not to put too much value on the other part of the text. The it either does five or it, they sack a creature because this is kind of a combination of the types of cards that let your opponents make choices that are best from them. And when you see that those two choices are split on two completely different axes, then that means that that power, uh, excuse me, that effect is a lot less powerful. So if they can say, sure, I'll sack a token or I'm at 20, I'll go to 15, whatever. 
Uh, those are two completely separate things and they can just make the best choice and they generally will make the best choice from themselves. So we don't put a huge amount of stock on that, but it's free and it, it's like super fine. And look, the, either one does matter. Either affects the board or it basically says this dragon has haste and got to attack with vigilance this turn or whatever. <laughs> so either way, you're super happy to have it. And I have demanding dragon at an A. That, that's that got to be uh, on the short list. Probably, I would guess something like you know, top seven, top eight cards in the set or whatever. It's it's not fancy, but boy, it's yeah. good. Just super raw powerful. You know, we the term we use, of course, in, in games is pushed. And demanding dragon feels a little pushed. You know, it's just like, hey, let's just let's just do it. Five, five for five with flying, with upside. You know, it's like also it's carrying away like a zebra or something. <laughs> I love brutal. that picture, actually. Um that is pretty sick. Uh next is dismissive pyromancer. Uh, looks like the library is burning down, but he's just sort of <laughs> checking out a book here. Uh, one, in a, one in a red for a 2-2 human wizard. So here we have another bear with upside. This one's rare, uh, but again, not a goblin this time. Two abilities. First one, red, tap, discard a card, draw a card. Love it. Really? Yeah, that's good. So uh, rub edge, yep. And then the next one is two in a red, tap, sacrifice him. It deals four damage to target creature. Now, dude, this card's great. Yeah, so now this is a bear with upside. Like Dark Dwell Oracle, like yeah. it's a minor upside. This guy, I mean, re like you basically get to rummage as much as you need until either you know, like you you actually need to kill some one, one of the creatures on the table, or you know, it, it, it will win the game or something like that. Like I I think this card is on like efficient on nearly every axis. Even the four damage is actually kind of uh, efficient. And so I would say mm -hmm. this is very close to an auto include and like a B plus A minus kind of range. Yeah, I have B plus for dismissive pyromancer. You you do not get this level of power in a two drop creature very often. Uh, thinks great. Yeah, just do, does exactly what you want to do at all stages. Dismissive pyromancer B plus. Also great flavor text. It's like burn. <laughs> Burn, keep, burn. He's <laughs> just torching the library. Next is Goblin Trash Master. Oh, boy. You know what we need to do, TPS? We need to think of one of our friends, and this is going to become their nickname. Uh, Who is the we, – we'll, we'll think about this later, but somebody's got to be the Goblin <laughs> Trash Master. Yeah. <clears throat> Maybe I could say it on coverage or something, right? Like the Goblin Trash Master himself. Uh, so this is two red red for a 3-3 three, three Goblin Warrior at rare. And Goblin Trash Master is a Goblin Lord, so other Goblins you control get plus one, plus one. And also has an activated ability, Sacrifice a Goblin to destroy target's artifact. All right. Oh, the artifact part is not really that exciting. It's not going to come no. up that often. And, so we have uh, actually and... a fa fairly simple card here, don't we? A four mana, yeah. you know, a, a, a hill giant Lord, basically. Yeah, and I mean... There's a reasonable amount of goblins in the set, so it's not it's not nothing. Um, so a hill giant lord, but it is double red. I right. would say this card's like a C plus. It's actually it, it's it's funny that I, I, I there's two C's in in the rare slot. That doesn't happen very often. No, and, it's uh, interesting. Is, yeah, so I, I would say this card is like pretty mediocre. But if you're heavier red, if you have something like eight or nine mountains in your deck or more. I think you could play it. Um, it probably will pump one or two or maybe three creatures you have. And, you know, that's that's okay. But it's not something that pushes me into red. Yeah, agreed. Um, C plus for Goblin Trash Master with the caveat that if you do build around it, it will get better. Um, Laughless Dragon Queen is next. And she's four red red for, you guessed it, a 6-6 six, six flyer. Now, she's a legendary creature, though, at rare – I will add. So this is kind of interesting. The only mythic we've covered so far has been that apex of power, that crazy card. <laughs> so this is a, a regular rare. Um, but boom, right off the bat, TBS, uh, unless we're talking about a downside on Lathless, I'm already sold. Six mana, six, six flying. I'm in. Uh, yep. And then it says, uh, whenever an another non-token dragon enters the battlefield under your control... Create a five-five red dragon creature token with flying. <laughs> Come on, jeez! I mean, oh, yeah, it's like you like what like, mean? I like. I mean, Windmore is cool. <laughs> and, oh, that's and, and funnily insane. enough, uh, funnily enough, in this set, it's 
actually not impossible for it to trigger because there is a there are some common and uncommon ways of getting dragons yeah. so there's the common um one that does three damage i can't remember the name exactly yeah mm-hmm. um yep. and then dragon egg actually also triggers this so you know oh, crazy. Not, not, not to say not to say that you actually need too much more than a six six uh five or six but i mean this is not impossible to to trigger. I think in a lot of sets, only other rares would trigger this card. So th- there's a little bit more upside. Um, the pumping ability, obviously, you know, generally just pumps herself. Yeah, but I haven't again, read that part yet. <laughs> oh, <laughs> one in oh. a red uh, dragons you control get plus one, plus zero until end of turn as well. I mean, come on, like Lathless is insane. Yeah, this this I, is insane. I actually think it's probably slightly worse. Than demanding dragon just because I think a five five for five is, is a little bit worse than a six six for six, even counting like all the other abilities. But I mean, you know, beggars like not beggars can't be choosers. Like you, you're just basically the rich get richer in this case. Yeah, you're just gonna and and you did mean to say that the five five for five is a little better than a six six yes. for six, right? That, that's okay, right. yeah, that, that's that's what I thought too. Um, still, I look at Laughless Dragon Queen. I'm putting this in every deck that I could possibly cast it in, and I'd say she's probably an a yeah i'll just say a like that's just a pretty classic bomb right like i don't care about the other text um basically i'm just going to assume that laughless is going to be on her own so she's six mana six six flying with one and a red fire breathing i'm in whatever i'm playing that card every single time and it's probably going to win me the game a good good chunk of it absolutely uh next is sarkon fireblood so this is our other mythic rare for red uh one red red so we got a three mana planeswalker here uh three loyalty when he comes down plus one you may discard a card if you do draw a card so plus one to rummage another plus one so two plus one abilities the second one is add two mana in any combination of colors spend this mana only to cast dragon spells (laughs) (laughs) talk about the rich get richer and then the ultimate if you can go three plus 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 minus (laughs) is you get four five five red dragon creature tokens with flying that's minus seven to ultimate no so this this one is um like i I like to call him a worse rummaging goblin um being a planeswalker, yeah, a that, rummaging goblin that can attack with, like Hearthstone style. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a, it's a got a got a little bit more of a drawback actually from rummaging goblin because um, obviously just mm-hmm. normal combat kills Sarkan. Um, even if you actually happen to have uh, dragons to cast off this, I actually think this card might not even be worth playing. That's how bad it is. It's kind of a D plus because I mean rummaging goblin's probably like a. I don't know, C minus card or even worse. Yep. And I think this is worse than a Robin G Goblin in, you know, 99% <clears throat> of cases. And so, yeah, I, I, this is funny. This is a, this is a planeswalker that's worse because it's a planeswalker. Yeah. Very strange. <laughs> it's somehow a liability. Uh, interesting. I wonder, do you put any weight? on the fact that people freak out when there's a planeswalker on the battlefield and start throwing creatures away into it and you know we'll just do all this absurd stuff not really i think people can kind of you know they'll look at this creature and they'll i mean no one's got to think that like if you get turboed out like with laughless the next turn after casting sarkin i mean good game i mean you're already mm-hmm. going to lose to laughless anyway so i don't think sarkin yeah. helping uh, like helping things does anything to, to that situation so i think most players maybe the pre-release you might get someone to freak out but i think most pptq players and up are going to be able to figure this out yeah uh d plus I, I think d plus <laughs> might even be a little bit generous but i guess i mean just d r- yeah rummaging is actually a good ability especially good in course right course sets so let's call it a d but uh man i i i, I you've got to be you know I, I don't know this guy's pretty bad all right, I'll go D plus on Sarkon Fireblood. I like rummaging. I like the fact that, look, if you do get to ultimate, if your opponent's just doing nothing, you will win the game. Maybe there's a little graveyard. But, yeah, basically it's an enchantment that just lets you <laughs> <laughs> rummage every turn and can't block. It's not yeah. that great. Um, next is Sarkon's Unsealing. This is three and a red for an enchantment at rare. Whenever you cast a creature spell with power four, five, or six, Sarkon's Unsealing deals four damage to any target. 
Whenever you cast a creature spell with power seven or greater, Sarkhan's Unseenly deals four, deals four damage to each opponent and each creature and Planeswalker they control. So we've got a, a, an enchantment here that comes down for four mana, does stone nothing, just yeah. nothing. But the first time you trigger it, when, and, and the, the easiest way is to cast a creature spell with power four. That that's your that's the lowest that you can go. It does four damage. It basically kills a creature on the other side just off of that first trigger. I think this card hmm. is pretty good, actually. I mean, obviously there is a little of a build around cost. I mean, so maybe we'll consider it a build around deck. But I mean, four. Like four power is not that high a cost. There is a couple commons that do it. There's a couple creatures at three mana that do it. So it's, you're not like you know just playing expensive spells in your deck. Um, and the upside is pretty huge. Like you, it's really really high. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even if you just get one trigger off it, obviously, like it's it's going to be worth it. Um, that being mm-hmm. said, if you you know spend a couple turns not triggering it after you cast it that's going to be a little bit of a liability. I think this card is worth building around. I think that the payoff is good because you can actually kill your opponent with um, with the first trigger. And so I would say, you know, let's, let's call it a build around A because I think if you have the deck, it's really good. Hey, I, I looked it up, by the way, and of the non-X spells, so... I'm just looking at creatures that just natively have, uh, you know, seven power or more. Yep. <laughs> because I'm thinking big here. Right? Yeah. We've got Chromium the Mutable, <laughs> Gaspark Twins, Gigantosaurus, Inferno Hellion. That was the 7-3 trample oh, yeah. one. Ooh. And then we haven't quite got there yet, but I think that you and I will both be very happy when we get to our friend Palaka Worm. <laughs> so some beefy stuff. But, you know, the key here is there's only five of those. Uh, in the set. So I think that it is appropriate to focus in on that first activation and trying to do that. I like giving Sarkons on Ceiling a build around grade. I mean, you're not just throwing this in if you have one or two, four, four power or more creatures. You are going to have to take, for example, I think a good example of this is you and I, uh, when we talked about the red commons in the mm-hmm. set, you know, there's a four, two, and then there's the three, two with Menace, right? And th- there's, this is a perfect tiebreaker between taking, you know, ostensibly worse cards on the surface and, uh, you know, put him in your deck to try to trigger this and then the green enchantment that we talked about as well. Yeah, I think so. So I like build around B, though. I, I think Sarkhan's Unsealing is legitimately, like you said, first trigger pays you back. After that, you're free rolling it. I think that it's not that hard to set up. Sure, it's a bad top deck if you've already kind of curved out. And sure, it might make you play a little bit off curve. But man, you get right back in a game if you get to start chucking four damage around even just like twice over the course of a game. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so build around B for Sarkons on Ceiling. Last red card is called Spit Flame. <laughs> and it's two and a red for an instant at rare. It says it deals four damage to target creature. And whenever a dragon enters a battlefield under your control, you may pay red. If you do, you return spit flame from your graveyard to your hand. So let's let's disregard that second part um, because it'll happen so infrequently and focus in on two and a red instant uh, four damage to target creatures. So this is effectively the same thing as electrify. It just costs a mana less and, and that's, awesome yeah and, and that's important i think i think uh, the cost of three yeah. and four um often you know is the difference between being able to double spell and not double spell and so i i think that in sealed and dra- especially draft double spelling is how you start turning the corner against opponents so i mean this makes this card you know effectively for me good b plus like candidate i i think that it's super efficient um if you happen to return it, it's obviously amazing because the card itself is great. So if you get two B pluses on a card, you know we're talking about an A an A range. But I, I think mm-hmm. I think most of the time you you, you don't consider that uh, second ability. So uh, B plus for me. Yeah, B plus for Spit Flame. And then I'm not trying to belittle the second ability. When it triggers, fantastic. It's just, you know, game in and game out. That's probably not what you're going for. All right, that moves us to green. Our first green card is called Elvish Clan Caller. Green, green for a 1-1 Elf Druid at rare that says other elves you control get plus one, plus one. So we have another Lord. Uh, unfortunately, the mana cost and to power and toughness, the vanilla test here is 
brutal on Elvish Clan Caller. 1-1 one, one for GG is not good. So let's see what the activated ability is. You can pay four green, green, and tap. So six mana tap to search your library for a card named Elvish Clan Caller. Put it onto the battlefield and shuffle your library. No. Yeah. No, 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 no. I'm just, I, I think this is, I, I was hoping for build around and I don't even think you have that going on here. This is just a constructed card, not supported at M19 and very likely just an F. Yeah, there's not enough elves in the, in the set to really ever make this any good. I think F is pretty appropriate here. Sorry, Elvish Clan Caller. Next is, yeah, Gigantosaurus. Love this guy. <laughs> I've been waiting to read this mana cost on the show for quite a while. It is G G G G G for a 10, 10 dinosaur at rare with a block of flavor text and nothing else. So five mana, 10, 10, but TVS you've, you, you're, you're very in tune to mana costs. Like how many, uh, you know, forests you need in a deck to reliably cast this two G G card or whatever. What about G G G G G? For a mana cost, five green mana symbols. Okay, so this is not something I have a ton of experience in, obviously, because 5G... Ha- I don't think they've ever printed it. <laughs> yeah, yeah so, so some of the deuses from um, from uh, Lorwyn and stuff like that like have a similar mm. cost. Um, in most cases, in like way back then, you have to be almost monocolored to be able to cast those things. So I would say the least you should be having in your deck is 12. So, and that's the mm-hmm. least. And I, I, I think uh, if you have 12, 12 out of like 17, we're talking about here, you're going to be able to cast this, let's say, you know, by your seventh or eighth land. Um, so, mm-hmm. so if you want to think of it that way, it's, it's kind of like a seven cost 10, 10, maybe an eight cost 10, 10. Um, and when you look at it that way, it starts looking like um, your friend, uh, uh, like what was his name? Um Bronto, uh, what's the what's the guy? Uh, Brontodon? No, not Thrashy Brontodon. The, um, the oh yeah, the nine drop. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's kind of like yeah. That. That's that's a little brutal. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, if you happen to be mono green, or you happen to have maybe you know a couple elves, this card becomes a little bit more playable. I think in general, um, you know, you'll know the decks that you want to play it in, and I think honestly, if you wanted to be like the most optimal, you, you're looking at like one or two non-forest lands in your deck to, to be able to cast this, like even with any sort of regularity on turn um, five or six. And so yeah. um, at that point, so. you know, that's not a lot of decks. Right. And if, we, if we're really calling this, I mean, I think that's a very apt comparison, Ancient Brontodon, because as you said, your seventh or eighth land is when you're going to be able to cast it. If you have 12, that is not turn seven or eight. That is turn 12 to 14. Like <laughs> you could be on turn 10, turn 11, turn 12, waiting to cast this thing. And then when it comes down, it has no evasion or anything, though it is huge. And that's good. The one other thing we should mention, of course, is that there are cards like Druid of the Cow in the set, as well as uh, Gift of Paradise, which you could, you know, maybe put on your non forest land and help you know, generate double green plus two forests, and then you just need one more. There are other ways to get this thing onto the battlefield, but my gut says that that draft in and draft out, that this just isn't going to be a card that you're terribly concerned about picking highly and probably isn't worth building around. Yeah. It's, it's, I just don't value huge... Like, I value it higher than I used to. I used to actually undervalue just really, really big creatures, but now I, I still need, for this level of bending over backwards to try to fit it into my mana base i just want something that wins the game more consistently than gigantosaurus will uh, on, on on the on the positive side it uh triggers sarkin's unsealing <laughs> hey there you go that, that was one of them yeah so i loved ancient brontodon but i think i gave it a d and i think i would give gigantosaurus a d as well yeah i think so a, a, a d um but the one good thing is if you happen to be heavy green, you can let this kind of like float around in, in a draft because you're almost definitely getting it back. Yeah, definitely. All right, next card is Goreclaw, Terror of Calcisma. And that is a legendary, actually it's a legendary bear. So it's three and a green for a four, three legendary creature bear at rare. 
and it's uh, it's it has a couple of abilities. The first one is creature spells you cast with power four or greater cost two less to cast. Okay, that's something, but yeah. that's a little weird. But something. It's remember, it's power. You, you're actually checking the power of the creature, <laughs> not its mana cost. And then the second is whenever Gore Clotter of, uh, of Calcisma attacks. Each creature you control with power four or greater, seeing a theme here, uh, gets plus one, plus one, and gains trample until end of turn. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, well, first okay, thing... Okay, there's some stuff here, I guess. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm a little upset that the um, the bear lord is not a 2-2, but, you know, I'll get over that pretty quickly. <laughs> or a 4-4 four, four or something, like yeah. double is, I don't know. <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> um, but uh, getting more to the point, um, this is obviously meant to be a little bit of the payoff for having a deck full of fours. And, I mean, both abilities are actually pretty reasonable. I actually think that the um, first ability actually allows you to cast things like um, the uh, Colossal Dreadmore for four mana. And that's actually, that's that's nothing to sneeze about. I mean, we used to get that 2-4 uh, uh, guy that uh, reduced the cost of um, dinosaurs in in the in uh Ixalan set and uh, this, one, this one's like a better one because his, his stats are better and he has a second ability and the second ability is absolutely excellent because it does exactly what you want to do with big creatures it makes them bigger and gives trample yes trample being very key yeah um so here's the deal you're going to play this thing if it was a four mana four three uh, you would play it anyway. It would already be like a, a C minus or something like that, right? You'd be like, yeah, okay. It might make the cut. Um, the ability to ramp out the creatures, the the expensive creatures. I think, not sure how much to to put on that. I, I, um, it's 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 a it's a it's a small grade upgrade. I think I think I would you know it okay. would happen to be B up to B plus. So I think the entire package. But but it does trigger for itself, right? Goreclaw yes. is a five four trample when attacking. Yeah, that's right. So, mm, so that's pretty good. I personally would say this card is a B plus and maybe an A minus because it doesn't ask much of you at all. I think in general, green decks have a few creatures that. Have power four. So again, talking about double spelling, this allows you to do that uh, more effectively. Um, uh, mm-hmm. like when you cast this on turn four, so you know B plus. Uh, there's really nothing wrong with it, especially it's very castable too. It's only one green. Yeah, I, you know, you've actually talked me into it, TBS. I think Goreclaw Terror of Calcism is a B plus, and the reason is is like if your if your floor is. <laughs> Easy to cast three in a green, go attack you for a five four with a five four trampler the next turn. Yep. Like that's bigger than everything, you know, and and then it just has this random upside of like you can dump your hand if you happen to have some expensive stuff and it can even just be a game winner. Sure. B plus for Goreclaw, Terror of Calcisma. Kind of like it. Uh, next is Hungering Hydra. Okay. That's me. <laughs> this is a green, green X, as most Hydras are. Uh, an X spell. And also most Hydras are a zero zero. And this one is two. It enters the battlefield with X plus one plus one counters on it. So again, just to recap, that means that it's a two mana one, one or a three mana two, two or four mana three, three, et cetera. So never really crushes the vanilla test, but is acceptable, especially when you get up a little into the higher range. Can't be blocked by uh, one or more creature, uh, by more than one creature, excuse me. So you cannot double block. Menace says you must double block. Hungry and Hydra says you're in the arena with me. Mm-hmm. You may not block uh, with more than one creature. That's quite powerful depending on the size of the Hungry and Hydra. The last clause is whenever Hungry and Hydra is dealt damage, put that many plus one plus one counters on it. Okay. Boy, that's a lot of pressure on the opening <laughs> uh, power and toughness on this thing, isn't it? Yeah, I, I actually think it would be a mistake to cast it any smaller than at five mana, so a four four, and even four four seems to be the base. I agree. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, if you happen to get into a situation where they're forced to chump, it's obviously going to be good. But I, I actually don't think the last ability comes into play that much, um, unless your opponent is pretty desperate. So they won't like. I mean, it basically says you can't block it with creatures. Like you can't chump it. I guess is the easiest way to put it because it, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Or if you chump it, it's you're going to be chumping it for a long time. Yeah, I, I guess. Yeah, the way I read it is you must chump it if it's lethal. Otherwise, you are not blocking. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like if 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 you you know if I'm playing against you and you're like hungry and Hydra, it's a four four. I go okay, and I'm at say twelve, 
and you go attack you with it. And I have a three, three is my biggest creature. I'm not blocking, no. right? I'm not going to turn it into a seven, seven. I'm like, okay, I'm at eight and I'm going to hope to try to find a removal spell, a bounce spell, or, you know, something to lock the thing down. Um, this it, card is not amazing, but it's good. Yeah, I, 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 I think so. I mean, there's a few little tricks with it. Like uh, if you have a fight card, I actually, I know uh, Rabbit Bite is not a fight card, which actually would have been good with this card. Um, yes. I, I don't think there's a fight card if, as, long, as much as I can remember. No, I don't think so either. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, but if you had like huh. something that does a bit of instant, da- uh, instant damage, you could actually pump it with a lightning strike or something like that if you, you know, yeah. So if you needed that kind of um, pump in your creature, um, I right, look. I I, th- I think this is solid. It's just a B. Um, a Me too. It's a B. Yeah. It's flexible. Yeah. Hungry and Hydra gets a B. Flexibility, fine card, not overwhelming in any way. One thing also, just it doesn't have trample. Yes. So just don't forget that it does not have trample. All right. <laughs> this next guy does. It's Palaka Worm. Palaka, laka, laka. It's back. It used to be an uncommon back in Rise of the Eldrazi. And it also got reprinted in Modern Masters and stuff. It is rare now. Getting the respect he's <laughs> always deserved. Palaka Worm, four green, 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 seven mana, seven, seven trampler at rare. When it enters a battlefield, you gain seven life. And when it draw, when it dies, you draw seven. Just kidding, you draw a card. <laughs> so, I, I I think this is as the you best said, card Marshall. ever. Right? Yeah, it's as you said, Marshall. Like this card was an aberration and uncommon when it was printed before. I, I think you know yeah. you, you might like grumble a little bit the fact that if you happen to open it in one of the boosters that you didn't draft, but what the hell are you doing opening boosters you didn't draft? Um, because it's <laughs> <laughs> good, good recovery. I like it. <laughs> but I mean, in, in a limited sense, this is a very easy, um, a very easy rare. It, it, it just is great on the vanilla test. It, it's a big trampler. Um, it helps you come from behind a lot. So it's very good on the quadrant, um, uh, theory as well. I actually think this card is a, an easy B plus. A minus kind of card. I think it's a B plus for me, just a little bit under an A because um, seven mana is not as flexible as you'd hope. So it, you can't cast it until you actually get to that point of the game. Yeah, I would give Palaka Worm an A, uh, but with the caveat that you you can it is seven mana with triple green. You got to respect that. Do not go into this thinking that you'll just hit a land drop or two and then boom, you're going to be playing Palaka Worm. You need to work for it a little bit. But the reason why I actually bump it up into the A range is because it's bulletproof in the sense that even if it dies, you get the card back. It stabilizes your board as a huge blocker on the ground and it gives you seven life, which basically brings you out of range from any reasonable one-shot style attack or burn spell. And for whatever reason... They tack trample onto this thing. So if you're at parity or if you're ahead and looking to close out the game, Palaka Worm absolutely does that. Good when you're behind, good when you're ahead, etc. I love it all. The one thing is the mana cost. It is tough to cast. This is not Rise of the Eldrazi. This is not Modern Masters. This is a much more narrow situation. So get those Druid of the Cows, get those Gifts of Paradise, and Palaka it up. I will be first picking this almost every time I see it, unless green ends up being horrendous, which I do not think is the case based on my uh, couple of pre-releases that I got in. So I give yep. A for Palaka Worm. I'm, I'm going to upgrade mine to A- minus because I, you've convinced yeah. me. Yeah. He, he, resp- he, he says, <laughs> that's right, you respect this. Uh, next is called Prodigious Growth, and I have the uh, – extreme pleasure of using totally lost on a targeted thing from prodigious <laughs> growth it is a uh, four green green for an enchantment aura at rare it enchants a creature and you're not even going to believe this because i always complain about the the risk associated with these how about six mana aura <laughs> and what it does well it gives a creature plus seven plus seven and trample so extreme risk right six mana aura if your creature gets messed with from underneath it Boy, are you unhappy. But wow, plus seven, plus seven, and trample makes any creature on the battlefield huge. You're like, pro- potentially yeah. game-winningly huge, you know? 
Yeah, your opponent has like two turns to deal with this, with this card. Uh, I actually think the risk justifies the reward. So the the mm-hmm. reward justifies the risk. Um, mm. I, I think the first time you cast it, you should try and make sure that your opponent is tapped out or mostly tapped out in that situation. And so you kind of it acts like a mini um, like bane fire to your opponent because. You know, if you put it on a three three, it becomes a ten ten, and it's pretty hard for your opponent to actually like muster up enough blockers to actually uh, take it down. And then if they happen to have a removal, and that's a very small select um, like removal, no damage removals are going to very effectively kill it. Um, I think right. this card is you know pretty close to a B plus here because I the power is so high. Um, you know, obviously it can't reach A's because you know the downside is pretty big. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know it's funny. I, I you kind of scooped me there. I was actually going to give Prodigious Growth a uh, a B minus, which for me is like, I, like I might not sleep well tonight after giving <laughs> uh, an aura <laughs> of this cost. But you know, I will say. Uh, so the the game I was talking about, where I played, my opponent played Prodigious Growth on a Life Linker. Oh, geez. And I happen to have the answer ready, and they needed to do it. But the thing I like about Prodigious Growth is that it's actually interesting that it's so expensive that might actually be better because your opponent will often have used up their removal on your creatures that you've curved out with. And you know what? It doesn't really matter what creature you put this on. Like on a 1-1 token, you just made an 8-8 Trampler. That is the biggest thing on the battlefield, not remotely close. And if you throw this on any normal creature, you know, like you mentioned, a 3-3, come on, it's very rare that you have a situation where a 10 10 trampler can be profitably blocked, right? Downsides, uh, it's, it, you can interact with it. It's extremely risky. Uh, death touchers are really annoying against it if they have the dagger back basilisk and they're oh, just yeah. like, okay, well, here's my one hit with my prodigious, you know, and, and you lose both cards. But I still, yeah, you B minus for me for prodigious growth, which is about the biggest compliment I can give. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm hoping to go for Gigantosaurus, then Prodigious Growth, and just, like, you know... All... <laughs> <laughs> That's not even 20. <laughs> I know, but, you know, like, I'm sure I hit with okay. a pair or two. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, next one is called Runic Armasaur. I actually had two of these in my first sealed pool. Um, and fine little card. It's one green green for a 2-5 dinosaur. Now, I'm going to tell you what the rules text does, TBS, but how do you vanilla test three mana 2-5? Uh, I think it's actually over the curve for um, for for a three mana. So I think I played it. I, I I almost always play it. You know, providing about like eight or nine um, forests in my deck. Okay. Yeah. And and you know, one way just to get a quick snapshot of that is that we're getting seven power and or toughness for our three mana. And you know, we're pretty happy, generally speaking, if it's equal. Like if it was a three mana three three, I'd be like, that's good. Like that's above the curve, right? Like, you know, we do have a common at that, but that doesn't happen that often. And usually it's only in green. Here we're actually getting an additional point there, all the way up to seven for three mana. Now I'm gonna read the Uh, The rules text now, but it actually doesn't come up that often. It says, whenever an opponent activates an ability of a creature or land that isn't a mana ability, you may draw a card. Yeah. So there are some cards, you know, some creatures, uh, you know, that will have repeatable effects. We've already mentioned a few of them, uh, like the Dismissive Pyromancer or the Dark Dweller Oracle, that kind of thing. So keep it in mind. And you do need to see it and say, I'm going to draw a card off of that. Uh, the land part comes up basically never, but it is fairly rare uh, for the Runic Armasaur to get value on that metric. So it's probably better just to assume that it's going to be a 2-5 for 3 and play it because you want that. And then if you get free rolled some extra value, hey, scoop it up. Why not? Yeah. Um, go ahead. Yeah, no, no. So, I mean, in most cases, your opponent will not activate their abilities in the face of this. Like, there's very few activated abilities that, you know, mm-hmm. that, that come up that are worth your opponent drawing a card. And so, unless they're desperate, they probably won't uh, trigger this. Right. So, I don't know. This guy's fine to me, uh, like a C plus. Like, I don't really have him up in the B range. Yeah, C plus is exactly where I was thinking. All right. Runic Armasaur gets a C plus. Next is uh, the one of the two mythic rares for green. It's Scape Shift. Two green green for a sorcery. Sacrifice any number of land. Search your library for up to that many land cards. Put them onto the battlefield. Tap, then shuffle your library. I'm going to keep this one short and sweet. So this is a constructed card. It is worth money. You should take it if uh, if, if you're trying to draft for, for dollar value. It's an F and limited. There's no use for it uh, whatsoever, so it won't be making the cut. What if you're playing five colors, Marshall? <laughs> <laughs> 
all right, you got me. It's an A. Uh, yeah. I, I'm just on F for Scape Shift. There's no corner cases, right? Yeah. No, no. I, I, I would not be playing this guy. Thorn Lieutenant is our next card. It's one in a green for a 2-3 Elf Warrior at rare. And uh, whenever it becomes a target of a spell or an ab ability an opponent controls, you get a 1-1 one, one green Elf Warrior token. You can pay five in a green to give Thorn Lieutenant plus four, plus four until end of turn. Wow. This is a lot of really good stuff. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it kind of reminds me. Uh, what's the name of that Vigilant 2-3 guy for two mana? Um, he was... Good and constructive for a while. Oh, they got bigger with the lance? Yeah. it's It reminds me of that guy. I can't remember exactly what, yeah. what the name of that guy. I can't remember either. Yeah. But yeah. So 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 it, it's obviously very good in the vanilla test. A two mana, two, three is above the curve. Um, I actually think that um, it's almost better than a three, two at the same cost because um, like the majority of creatures are like, two toughness um in in uh mm -hmm. at two mana so it actually trumps uh, a lot of those ones uh the ability means sorry the first ability means that it's going to get some value on the way out because you probably won't target it unless it's dying so it just let's say leaves a one one um elf warrior and um it gives you like a place to sink your mana in the late game so i actually think you know when you think about all of those things put together i mean this makes like you know, very, very solid B plus card. Uh, it's never going to be so overwhelming that it's going to win you the game, but it really is very efficient and is a reasonable top deck in the late game. Yeah, I, I, I just, I have a hard time finding something bad to say about this thing, right? Yeah. Like, w what's yeah. the, like, well, what's the argument for not taking and playing this in every green deck? There just isn't one. You know, that's just yeah. th this card is is just straight up good at on basically all metrics, while perhaps not being overwhelming. You know, at any specific one, right? Yeah, it's just good at all points. It's I feel like Thorn Lieutenant's like a B because it just hits on all these metrics, even if it doesn't hit them super hard. Right. I mean, the kind of card I just want to have in my deck. You know. Yeah. No. I I I think this is kind of like a good bread and butter card that um you know probably better than almost every uh like uncommon or common uh green card yeah that's that's it's right in that range so i'm gonna say b for the uh, thorn lieutenant next is vivian reed and uh, vivian reed is a planeswalker so mythic rare uh she's three green green for a five loyalty planeswalker with plus one ability, look at the top four cards of your library. You may reveal a creature or land from among them and put it on your hand, put, put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. So that's great. That's effectively draw a card. And, uh, you know, in limited, when you're looking at four cards, the chances of seeing a creature or a land are extremely high. Mm -hmm. um, your minus three ability, so she can come down. So five mana, five loyalty, minus three, she would be left at two. Destroy target artifact, enchantment, or creature with flying. Mm -hmm. So kind of green color pie centric stuff, uh, expensive to do, but when you know you need to do it, you need to do it, you know, take out a dragon or some really annoying artifact or enchantment. And then her uh, ultimate is minus eight. So within reach five uh, plus immediately, she's at six, you say go two more turns of plusing and then a minus. It's not easy, but you can do it. You get an emblem with creatures you control, get plus two, plus two, have vigilance, trample and indestructible. So, wow, she's powerful. Yeah, she's super powerful. Um, I, I think the, the the most notable aspect of Vivian is a good plus with a high loyalty. So you know, you don't generally don't get something that starts at five loyalty at five mana. Um, you know, the, the plus is as you say, you get value immediately. So you know, it's it's pretty rare that Vivian doesn't replace herself at least card wise um, immediately and. Uh, I wouldn't underestimate the minus three in, in limited because the way you lose all the games, especially in green decks, is uh, to flyers. And so... Um, totally. Yeah, so so, so <laughs> totally this, is, this, is a, this is a great a, a ability for a green deck to have. And we will fit into every green deck. I mean, I think this is a actual solid A because um, when you can get overwhelmed very, very quickly with this card. Um, and then the, the ultimate is like game ending. And and I like that with all it is. So it is. it's not one of those ones that you need to like do you know a little bit of like you know you, you have to wait a few turns. You generally win within one or two turns of ultimating her. 
Yeah, totally. I think Vivian reads an A. Uh, the key thing for me is five mana. By the time you pass the turn back, she can have six loyalty. That is a yep. lot. That is yep. that is asking a lot. Uh, last card is called uh, Vivian's Invocation. By the way, um, <clears throat> Sylvan Advocate was what we were thinking of, right? Oh, yeah, that's right. That's the one. Oh, that was bugging me. Vivian's <laughs> Invocation is five green green for a sorcery at rare. Look at the top seven cards of your library. You may put a creature card from among them on the battlefield. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. When a creature is put onto the battlefield this way, it deals damage equal to its power to target creature an opponent controls. That last line is actually super critical here, right? Because Vivian's Invocation, seven mana sorcery, you're going to hit a creature. You're looking at seven cards. It's a limited deck. You're going to hit something. But almost for sure that creature is going to cost less than seven mana. So it, yeah. it wouldn't be yeah. worth it to do this. But if we tack on the fact that it gets to uh, to punch another creature when it ETBs, does that actually make it worth it? I think it might. I mean, I think you do need a few, like, big hits for, for me to, like – Play it, put it in my mm -hmm. deck. So, so you know, some colossal dreadmores or ghostbuck twins or mm. you know, gigantosaurus. gigantosaurus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and I mean, you know, if if you hit something that has at least three power, it's a reasonable punch um, to your opponent's creature. And then when so you say, mm -hmm. okay, well, you know, the upside is that I could find the best creature of the top seven. So, I think you know it's a Reasonable two for as long as you can reasonably two for one um, for, with this card, I think it's probably worth playing. It's probably not worth taking early. You probably need to see the the setup of your creatures uh, before you start taking cards like this. Yeah, ramp spells plus your creatures, and like you said, I think the real focal point are cards like Dreadmaw. I think that that's kind of where you need to be. Because sure, you might have a bomb, you might have a block worm or something. Great, no problem. But you need to be able to hit a few things that are that are on the middle end of the spectrum and still get value out of it to make Vivian's Invocation worth it. I'm not in love, but I can see it. I, I actually can see decks where you're like, no, I'm definitely going to play one of these and, and, and get my value out of it. Because it is a two for one if you can kill another creature. And that's really good. Um, I'm not trying to give it a high grade though. Um, I think this is a B. The, the, the truth, Maybe do you, I, B minus. B minus. Like, I, I, I think B is a little optimistic, but I think B minus is reasonable. Yeah. I, see, I was going to give it a D. Ooh. And my reasoning was there's going to be a lot of times when you just don't run this. Like if you don't have the proper creature set up or even or, or zero ramp spells, I feel like Vivian's Invocation is not going to be, you know, the type of card but when you do want it then i think it jumps up to like a B. okay the, I, so the, i don't really know where, where should my grade be for it then should it be under circumstances like should i just say it's build around. okay let's call it a build around it, it's a build around yes it's almost like we have a category <laughs> for this type of thing <laughs> it, build around b for vivian vacation it, it feels like wizards has, has tried to make a format where colossal dreadmore is one of the best cards in the set so <laughs> <laughs> you know, they said, we've reprinted so so many times. It's like, okay, maybe if we just make him legendary in some way by having everything trigger off Colossal Dreadmore, it's going to be good enough. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. So build around B for Vivian's Invocation. That moves us to white. And uh, first card is a Johnny Adversary of Tyrants. Two white, white for a four loyalty planeswalker at Mythic Rare, of course. Uh, plus one, put a plus one, plus one counter on each of up to two target creatures. That's pretty powerful. Yep. Minus two, return target creature card with converted mana cost two or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. So a Johnny can be at two loyalty and you can get a creature back if there's some target for it. And then minus seven for the ultimate. Uh, which is a little tough to get to. You get an emblem with, at the beginning of your end step, create three 1-1 one, one white cat creature tokens with lifelink. Wow, that is a very powerful planeswalker. Yeah, it's it's kind of weird. I mean, there. I, I think the one thing about this card is that the setup is actually kind of high. Like, you, if, if you don't have two mm -hmm. creatures on the table... Um, if you don't have a, a two um, cost creature in the graveyard, like it's not that powerful. That being said, if you have one of those two things and the things you're doing with them is like are, are pretty strong, then this becomes stronger. So uh, it, it's it's not a card that I actually would take that high because I th I, I, I I really th yeah I actually think that there's just you know putting two plus one plus one. I don't know. I mean, 
it's 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 just not the package is just not alluring enough. Um, it's it's good when it's when it's you know when you have the setup, but it's not like overwhelming if you have the setup. Right. It, this is not one of those play it you win the game planeswalkers, right. but boy, I'm looking at this thing and I'm just like, boy, any two creatures and they go, a Johnny, make my creatures bigger, go. And you're sitting there staring at five loyalty a Johnny with two medium to big creatures in front of you, and they're not getting smaller and it's not getting worse for your opponent. The minus two ability is mediocre, I think. Like you get back a two drop, okay. And limited, it's going to be often something not so great you know um and then of course the ultimate is very nice and it's not unattainable i mean four mana or yeah four mana four loyalty goes to five say go i mean you're two turns off of getting to seven and then ultimating if your opponent just doesn't have a way to attack into your bigger creatures they're going to be in big trouble okay so, so let me put it, I, I like a johnny a lot i don't know let me put it this way in, in quadrant theory how good is this card I actually think it's not particularly good coming back. Mm. And, and and all right, let's take a look. All right, so it parity, uh, very yes. good, right? Like the excellent card in parity because it will eventually break that parity. Ahead, obviously good, but again, we don't put a whole lot on that. Behind, uh, medium, medium minus to not very yeah. good, right? You might be able to get back a blocker and have like a, something for them to attack, but that's not great. Like that's not stabilizing your board. Um, and then uh, developing. Quite good. I mean, if you curve into a Johnny adversary of tyrants, your opponent's screwed. Like they, if you go two drop, three drop this, they are in very bad shape. Yeah. They're facing down five loyalty planeswalker, and you probably can afford to just attack them with your two and three drop. And they're like, okay, attack a Johnny, and you're like, cool, plus a Johnny again, take nine. You know, your opponent's going to die quickly. Mm. So, I mean, it, it does okay. I agree, though. It it does not fit the the archetype of like an A. And I don't think it is. I think a Johnny is a B plus though. I really do see the power here. Yeah, okay. I'm I'm gonna go with B. I I, I do like okay. take, take take your point. Um I, I I actually think curving out is you know one of those things that you're already kind of ahead as well. So it's kind of a little bit more of a win more. Because you know if if you curve mm. out and you play a, a four drop of any type, you're generally going to be punishing your your opponent. True. And so it's true. You know, if it's a 4-4 four, four or it's an Ajani, it feels very similar. Okay, yeah. Good card, though. That has some power. Uh, next is Ajani's Last Stand, two white-white for an enchantment at rare. Whenever a creature or planeswalker you control dies, you may sacrifice Ajani's Last Stand. If you do, you get a 4-4 four, four white avatar creature token with flying. Whenever a spell, or excuse me, when a spell or ability an opponent controls causes you to discard a card, if you control a planes, create a 4-4 four, four white avatar creature token with flying. So the second part is much more conditional, but the first one's not. Whenever a creature or planeswalker you control dies, you can sacrifice this thing and turn it into a 4-4 four, four flyer. Yeah, I think this card is good enough on, like, on the first like, line of text. So... Agreed. A 4-4 a four, four fly for 4, it's not like amazing, amazing. It's a little bit above rate if you get it immediately. I think the fact that your opponent can play around it at least, they can play around when it comes into play a little bit more, brings it down. Um, I think this card is, because of that, it's, it's probably a B to me, but a 4-4 four, four flyer uh, that your opponent can kind of choose when it happens is not, you know, it's it's never going to be overwhelming. No, I agree. Uh, I, I have it at like B minus C plus range. So I'll say B minus for a Johnny's last stand. There's some power here, but this is it's not overwhelming. Ooh, this next yeah. one is though. Cleansing Nova, three white <laughs> white for a sorcery at rare. Choose one, destroy all creatures or destroy all artifacts and enchantments. So a pretty classic sweeper here. Uh, generally speaking, we get these at the five mana range these days. And uh, this one is your classic reset button. Uh, look, I've I've made a lot of cases over the years about the times that these can become overrated, but the case I've never made <laughs> was that these aren't super powerful. Yeah. Um, Cleansing Nova is awesome. I would give it an A. Uh, this is the type of card that can change the outcome of a game that no other card in the set could. Yeah, and, and this for, for people out there who don't know kind of how um, cards like this are powerful, obviously, one, you know that it's in your deck and your opponent doesn't most of the time. Um, and even if they do, they kind of play weirdly. And and the other part is that you you should still put it in decks with creatures. I Like, I, I see a lot of people try and, like, you know, 
try and play a control deck with, with Cleansing Nova in, in Sealed or, or, or Draft. And that's not the way to play this card. It, it's just to know like what's in your hand, maybe kind of like ration out the, the threats you have so that you can actually come back from behind. You, you almost have to play a little bit of possum uh, here. I don't know if that's a term in actually in, in America, but... Um, it is. It oh, is. Okay, good. It yeah, is a know. term. Yeah. <laughs> I, it's something we say in Australia, so I wasn't sure. Um, you, you play a bit of possum, make it look like you, you, you know, you're missing some some like creature drops, and then you actually kind of like get like a maybe a four for two or something like a three for one situation, and and that's how you punish your opponent. But don't try and play a control deck. That's that's actually the way to actually get in a lot of trouble in the minute. Okay, uh, what what grade do you like for Cleansing Nova? I I said A. I just think this is the type of card that I want to have in my deck just based on raw power. Yeah, I, I, I have an A minus. I think I think sweepers are okay. like a, 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 but but pretty similar to you. Okay. Next is called isolate. It is white for an instant at rare. It says exile target permanent with converted mana cost one. <laughs> no. Yeah, uh, that's an F, right? I mean, there's just no like th- there's so few targets for it, uh, and they're usually not the kind of thing that you actually need to deal with. So isolate gets an F. Yeah. Uh, just too conditional. Don't, uh, don't next is stop, stop, oh, sorry. Yeah, Sorry. no, go ahead. Don't bring it after sideboard, even if you have a lot of targets. It's not going to ever be worth it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, next is Lena, Selfless Champion, four white, white for a 3 3 legendary human knight. And uh, she says, it says, when Lena, Selfless Champion, enters the battlefield, create a 1 1 white soldier creature token for each non token creature you control. So she brings one soldier with her for her ability or for herself, but then any other creatures you have that aren't tokens, or you're going to get, you know, two, three, four, maybe five tokens as well. And you can sacrifice her to have creatures you control with power less than Lena's power gain indestructible until end of turn. Yeah. This is a tough one. So I got a chance to play with this card. It's good. Uh, This card's very powerful. You play it, you get, uh, let's say, let's say the the baseline was a three, three with three one ones with it. That's good. That, yep. that is that is powerful. That helps you stabilize your board. That helps you attack around, you know, go wide, as we like to say. It works with some of the mass pump spells that we've seen in the set during the set review last week. And uh, and Lena's very powerful. I don't really know exactly when you would want to do the sacrificer and, and save your stuff, but probably just in the face of a card like Cleansing Nova or something like that, where you're like, oh, well, my creatures are going to die anyway. I'll just sacrifice Lena's Selfless Champion and save them. I don't view that part as a particularly amazing or important part of the card. I really like the fact, though, that if you have two other creatures, that's it, just two creatures on the battlefield that aren't tokens and you cast Lena Selfless Champion, that you're adding six power and six toughness over uh, four bodies, you know, that that's a lot. That That is a wide and, and powerful card and well worth the six mana, I think. Yeah, no, I, I, I think you've convinced me that, that that does seem like a pretty uh, powerful package. Um, just to speak to the second ability when you'd use it, I actually think it might come up when you're trying to do like two waves of alpha strikes where you you, you do it like one wave, um, you sacrifice Lena beforehand and then you actually do something like trumpet blast and, and you kind of like get, you actually kind of like really damage your opponent's defenses if they've set some up. And then the next turn, you know, you actually can attack again. Um, with with the leftover army, and so I I I, I think it does fit into the go wide strategy really well because sometimes you actually need two alpha strikes because your opponents you know either they're a token mm. deck so they get to trade off a little bit and this actually allows you to like really kind of damage your opponents um, you know like defenses. Sure, uh, Lena gets a B, yeah. B plus maybe. I think I think sure. a, I think a B because I, I I still think you know you need to untap with her and that's um, not always a guarantee. Okay, B for Lena, selfless champion. Next is Leonin, war leader. Two white, white for a four four cat soldier at rare. Uh, whenever Leonin, war leader attacks, you get two one one white crat, uh, cat creature tokens with life length that are tapped and attacking. My God, yeah, this cat packs a punch. Yeah, I mean, vanilla test excellent. The ability is excellent. This card is a pretty solid A for me because I think that, you know, 
any any game that you cast it on turn four and attack the next turn, you're going to be well ahead. Agreed. Yeah, A for Leon and more leader. That is awesome. Uh, next is Mentor of the Meek. Two and a white for a 2-2 human soldier at rare. Whenever another creature with power two or less enters the battlefield under your control, you may pay one. If you do, draw a card. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, this card is great, and it's great in the context of the set. I mean, like, white has a, a reasonable of token makers, and it doesn't actually have a clause that you generally see on cards like this. Usually it says non-token. This one doesn't actually say that. So you actually trigger um, this ability on tokens, which means that you can really, really get a roll on if um, you get like the first first couple triggers. Yeah, and we just mentioned Alina, Selfless Champion, which would be like 20 triggers for Mentor of the Meek. Also, Leon and War Leader, attack, make two one ones, pay two mana, draw two cards, like stupid. Um, Mentor of the Meek can absolutely get out of hand in these type of decks and these type of uh, builds and do not overlook it. Uh, also, if you have the ability to kill Mentor of the Meek, you should probably do so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I know that, you know, you, I mean, I've drawn tons of cards off of this in, in games. I mean, I've drawn, you know, five, six, seven cards off of Mentor of the Meek. It can get completely out of hand. And it has that thing where it kind of snowballs, right? Like that you draw yeah. more and now you're drawing more and more and more and you're hitting your lands and all of a sudden you can just always pay. And, and you're just going off. So I love Mentor of the Meek. I'm struggling with where to grade it. Um, I would actually say B plus for Mentor of the Meek. I really think this card is super, super powerful in these type of decks and kind of a must kill like the mini game style card. And, and so I'm going to say B plus for Mentor. Where do you have it at? Yeah, I, I think B plus is exactly where I have it at. It, it, the only thing okay. uh, the drawback is the body is a little bit under um, the vanilla test yeah. and, you know, it, it's pretty easy to kill. Yeah, exactly. Uh, next card is Remorseful Cleric. One and a white for a 2-1 Flying Spirit Cleric at rare. You can sacrifice it to exile all cards from target player's graveyard. <laughs> so that ability itself isn't super powerful. Conditional, maybe there's some spot where you want to do it in limited. But the key here is we're getting one and a white for a 2-1 with flying. And you know what? I'm in for that. I like that type of card. Yeah, I mean, it's, pu it's pure vanilla uh, vanilla test. And it, it does like you know, slightly over, um, it's, it's slightly better than the rate. And so I think this is kind of like a C plus card. C plus for Remorseful Cleric. Yeah, sorry, reassembling skeleton, but Remorseful Cleric is here. Also <laughs> of note, by the way, is that it is a spirit by creature type. And that means it can block that dock hand guy that, that we talked about in the, um, in the comments and commons, the one in a blue. Oh yeah. Dude. Yeah, this, there's not that many cards in the set that can block him, but this is one of them. Mm. Um, next is Mythic Rare Angel. So this could be really good, and it is. A Resplendent <laughs> Angel, one white, white for a 3-3 three, three flyer that says at the beginning of each end step, if you gained five or more life this turn, you get a 4-4 four, four white angel creature token with flying and vigilance. Free Sarah Angel. And has the activated ability three, white, white, white. So six mana until end of turn, Resplendent Angel gets plus two, plus two and gains lifelink, bringing her right up to a nice five, five that will then trigger and start spitting out the free Sarah Angels. This card is amazing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, obviously the base creatures, you know, really, really good three mana, three, three flyer. You know, you that already is kind of a B to B plus range. This ability, if you mm -hmm. happen to have the, the, the mana to, you know, activate the ability, Obviously, it's it's just amazing. I think it, like the game will end, you know, two turns after you start activating this stuff. So mm -hmm. I, I I I think that brings it up to a pretty solid A. Um, just just a note. Um, I, I I think you want to if you do get to play this card, you're going to want to have some upwards of about nine um, to ten planes in your deck to make sure that you can cut that you can actually activate the ability because I think that you actually mm. should prime your deck to activate this ability as fast as possible because um, that's that's why it's so good. Yeah, and and let's be honest, the first activation that you actually get to hit, your opponent's not coming back. They yep. just took five lifelink damage, and you got a free Sarah Angel. Like yep. that's that's the game. We're done here. <laughs> so A for Resplendent Angel, one of the better cards in the set for sure. Next is Sun Cleanser. This is a one and a white 
for a 1-4 at rare. When Sun Cleanser enters the battlefield, you choose one. You can choose one of these two things. First, remove all counters from target creature. It can't have counters placed on it or put on it for as long as Sun Cleanser remains on the battlefield. Or target opponent loses all counters. That player can't get counters for as long as Sun Cleanser remains on the battlefield. It's a lot of text that means uh, not a lot. <laughs> right. So how do you feel about a 1-4 for one and a white? I mean, it's 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 good. It beats a vanilla test. I mean, five five points of yeah. power toughness is, you know. It beats it in like the most, probably the one of the most unenticing ways. <laughs> <laughs> Sun Cleanser does not seem great to me, right? I mean, we're talking about like a C minus. Yeah, I think C minus is about right. I think, I mean, this kind uh, of like. This doesn't have a lot of application and limited. Yeah, no, no. This card is created for constructed, and so you should probably just remain. A little late, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I mean, a little late. I mean, you lose all your energy, so you know, make sure yeah. if you're playing some M19 limited, you make sure you uh, make your opponent lose all their energy. That's right. <laughs> uh, last white card is called Valiant Knight. It is three and a white for a three four human knight at rare. Other knights you control get plus one, plus one, and you can pay three white, white to have knights you control gain double strike until end of turn. Yeah, I, I'm not sure so how many the interesting thing there. about Right. There, there's a, some number of them. Remember, there's the uh, the one that makes two, two, two knights. Like, that's a great combo with Valiant Knight. But the truth of the matter is, is that even if you just read Valiant Knight as three and a white, three, four, which I love. Three and a four. Three, four is my favorite power and toughness for a four drop. Um it still has three white, white. It gets double strike until end of turn. Yeah. I mean, that's great. Yeah. I mean, that's a really good card. I, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think this card is, you know, as you say, vanilla makes it, you know, a C plus card because it's slightly over, over rate. But then when you think about like how hard it is to block if you have five mana up, um, I, I actually think this card is, you know, a solid B plus after that point. Yeah, I do too. I have B plus for Valiant Knight. Also love the fact that you can play it and then the next turn activate it. Uh, that's just a lot of damage coming in if, if needed. All right, that's going to do it for white. Moves us to the best color. Or maybe we'll find out blue. Gin of Wishes is back. Uh, this is a card that came out back in M10. Uh, it's three blue, blue for a 4-4 four, four flying Gin. And so right there, uh, B? Yeah, probably. I think so. Yeah, no, I actually think it's a B plus. I mean... Air Elemental is usually a B plus to me. Yeah, so B, B plus. So straight away, our baseline is very, very high. And it's got a really cool ability too. It says, um, Jin of Wishes enters a battlefield with three wish counters on it. Get it? And you can pay two blue, blue and remove a wish counter from Jin of Wishes to reveal the top card of your library. You may play that card without paying its mana cost. If you don't, exile it. So it's not quite draw a card, but it's close. Um in the later part of the game, at least, you just activate it, play the card, off you go, right? And the fact that you get it for free certainly matters. The fact that you don't get to ca uh, choose exactly when you cast it can be a little bit awkward, but whatever. To me, Gin of Wishes is like an A. Like, I look, I could get cute and say it's an A-, minus, but the truth is, is that it's already a B plus on its base. And if you get to activate the ability a couple of times, like you're just kind of running away with the game at that point. And uh, so for me, Gin of Wishes is like, an A trending slightly towards A minus, but I'm just going to give it an A. Yeah, I actually think it's a, it's an, a solid A. I mean, I remember when this was first released mm -hmm. in M10, um, this happened to be one of the best cards in the set. Um, and I think that M10 is probably a slightly more uh, powerful uh, creature set than um, what... M, uh, M19 is kind of looking like. So I think it's a little bit better than that, but I don't think it's as good as an A+. So I, I think A is a pretty good rating. Okay, A for Gin of Wishes, also just sweet. Uh, next is Metamorphic Alteration. This is one and a blue for an enchantment aura that enchants a creature. It's rare. As it enters the battlefield, you choose a creature. The uh, enchanted creature is a copy of the chosen creature. Mm. Huh? So this, this is a weirdo. <laughs> it, it basically yeah. clone, like forces a creature to be a clone. And um, I, I say it that way because you can actually play it on your opponent's creature as well as yours. Mm. So there's a bit of flexibility there where you can kind of like make their best creature the worst creature in play. And that's not nothing. Like that's 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 a, a little <laughs> bit of a, a, a change. I mean, it still makes it a creature. So it's not, it's not a true removal spell. 
Um, I still do don't think this card's very good. Um, it's just you know there's too many opportunities for it to be a dead card or just you know yep. just not like very useful. And so I think it's something like a D plus C minus. There's probably a D yeah. a D plus, but I can actually see myself you know boarding it in if. I see a few situations that turn up a lot. Like, let's say they have a lot of tokens, and so there's a there's a like a reasonable guarantee that there's a bad creature in play to make their creature bad. Yeah, like act as a crappy removal spell or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And- metamorphic alteration D plus. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, next is Mist Caller, which is blue for a one one Merfolk Wizard at rare. You can sacrifice it. Uh, and it says, until end of turn, if a non-token creature would enter the battlefield and it wasn't cast, exile it instead. This is clearly a nod towards constructed, towards some type of reanimator or something weird like that. So this is just an F and limited. Like, you're not going to play Mistcaller. There's no tribal, nothing going on. You just just don't play it. Yeah, I agree. Although, it does it does it work against our, our green rare? Uh, against uh, Vivian's... It and- does work against that rare, but I don't think that makes it... Right, we found it. <laughs> Cyborg F. <laughs> Next is Mystic Archaeologist. Oh, God, I love this card. One and a blue for a rare. It's a 2-1, so not so hot. Human Wizard, but you can pay three blue, blue to draw two cards. I like this card a lot. Me I, too. Yeah, it... I mean, the opportunity cost of playing is super low. A 2-1 for, for two is, you know, obviously it's not... It's, it's not amazing and it's slightly below um, what we want for rate. But, you know, the the opportunity cost of it is, you know, you you want some amount of two drops, so it goes in there. And then if you get to fire banner, like, it, this will take away the game very quickly. I mean, you activate it twice, you're so far ahead. Yeah. One, one uh, like, strategic thing I wanted to bring up was there's going to be situations where you're in a stable board situation. You know, neither player is really able to attack each other in a meaningful way. Uh, it might actually be worth it if you're like one land drop away to wait until you can cast and then activate the archaeologist in the same turn just to take away the risk of saying mystic archaeologist go and they're like oh i guess i found a target for my shock now like that wasn't really helping them break the board stall and then you don't get the cards that way look if the game's for sure gonna go long make sure you get your value otherwise just run it out there you know you do you do what you got to do you run it out and and you activate it you know Whenever you have the time to do so. Yep. Sounds good to me. Uh, B? Um, yeah, I think solid B. I don't think it's it's a B plus, B. But, but B is, is good. not an A. Nah. Yeah. I mean, I want it to be an A, but it, it's not. <laughs> All right. So B for Mystic Archaeologist. Next one's a, a quick one. It's um, Omniscience. Seven, blue, blue, blue. So 10 mana enchantment at Mythic Rare. You may cast spells from your hand without paying their mana cost. Just not the type of thing you're going to be doing limited. It's just an F. Yep. Uh, it's just too much to ask. Uh, next is one with a machine. This is three and a blue for a sorcery at uh, Rare. It says draw cards equal to the highest converted mana cost among artifacts you control. Pretty sure this is a constructive card and probably not even. Yeah, I think so too. Like where where would it need to be for you to be like, okay, I mean, it would be three, yes. right? And even then it's But if you don't have an artifact, it draws zero. Yeah, it's it's a lot of work to to get three. I mean, if you if you start like drawing five cards from it, I think then it becomes like, you know, very, very enticing because five cards is just so many cards to, to come back from. Um look if you happen to have a curve of artifacts from like three to to five, and you know, let's say you had six or so total at three to five, maybe I'd consider playing this card. Okay. Setup cost high. Where, where do you want to? Do you, you want to give it a build around? I mean, you can't just jam it into any deck. So I guess it's a build around. Yeah. Uh, yeah, build it's around a build around C, C minus. plus or something. Yeah, well, build around C. Well, we'll be in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's fair. Okay. Uh, next is patient rebuilding. It's three blue blue for an enchantment at rare. It says at the beginning of your upkeep, target opponent puts the top three cards of their library into their graveyard. Then you draw a card for each land card put into the graveyard this way. So I've actually I haven't played this card. Um, I didn't get it in my pre-release. But I have seen it and I have heard about this card. I've heard that it's one of the best cards in the set, which is something. It seems I very, did, very good. Yeah, I actually didn't like reading it. I didn't think it was, 
but but actually seeing it and and hearing some other players play it, I think this card like does two things. One, it's inevitability. Like you're gonna win the game, mm-hmm. in, let's say about six or seven turns, um, just because of the mill. Mm-hmm. And so you know, if if the game gets to that point, that's great. But also, you do get back a lot of like you know, the investment that you put in because you're drawing cards as well. You're probably drawing something in the order of about, you know, an extra card a turn. Um, and so when you look at it that way, it's like, okay, this is a Howling Mine plus it, it's, it's a it's a win condition. Um, I, I can see exactly why this card is likely like an A minus, maybe even an A, but I have, I'll, I'll, I'll reserve my A until I get to play it myself. Yeah, I'm going to give it a B plus for patient rebuilding. My my reasoning is this. If you're behind, this card is completely awful. Like you, you, you can't take five mana. Like it's a huge, huge cost to just pay five mana and your opponent's like, you didn't do anything to the board in any capacity. You're like, no, I just spent five mana. They're like, okay, take seven. You're like, all right, we can't block. I didn't remove anything there. that That is a massive, like limited can be very tempo oriented and patient rebuilding is extremely slow in that sense. If you've stabilized, this is the card I want, period. It draws me extra cards and it gives me a win condition. That's all I care about. It It warps the entire game around itself. And it is traditionally the most difficult to deal with type of permanent and enchantment. So I like it. I think I'm going to give it a B for patient rebuilding. I think this is just going to end a ton of games. I think this is going to be really good and sealed, uh, especially. But there's going to be matchups in board states where it's really bad. Really, yeah. really, really bad. Like much, much worse than the basically any creature that costs five mana, for example. Mm-hmm. So I don't want to, I don't, you know, and it doesn't help you come back when you're behind and all that stuff too. So sure. that is a sweet card though. I'm going to get people with it. <laughs> Next is Psy Master Thopterist. It's two and a blue for a one, four legendary creature, human artificer at rare. Whenever you cast an artifact spell, create a one, one colorless Thopter artifact creature token with flying. And you can pay one and a blue and sacrifice two artifacts to draw a card. Yeah, this is a build around. It's it, like, mm-hmm. I mean, obviously it does nothing if you don't have artifacts in your deck. I mean, it's a one, four, for three. Uh, it's not the worst yeah. stats. But uh, if you do have artifacts, I mean, the payoff's pretty reasonable. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, it's like a CC, a CC plus kind of like one if you happen to make, you know, if you have seven or I think you need seven artifacts. That's the. That, that, I, I don't, That's the I don't, number. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, 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 I don't think like activating this once is that good. But if you're act- able to activate it maybe two, three, four times, then you know you, you start getting into like, oh wow, this is a, a lot of one one flyers. So I, I actually think you need over over four and probably on the order of six mm-hmm. and seven to 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 really be happy about playing this. Okay, so Psy Master Thopterus build around probably a B though. I mean, this card's really good if you're do if you're putting in the work for it. Yeah, that's that's fair enough. You know, I mean, you're drawing cards, you're making Thopters. Uh, next card is called Supreme Phantom. It's one and a blue for a one three spirit at rare with flying that gives your other spirits plus one plus one. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like vanilla test wise, it's actually not bad. A one three flyer for two mana is not not True. worst. Um, I think blue has he has a deckhand guy. Um, I'm not sure if there's any other spirits that are easily at hand. I think there's probably a couple here and there, but probably probably just a, a kind of a D plus card, C C plus. Yeah, it's like a C or something. Right? Yeah, I mean it's a one three flyer. It's like sure, sure. Oh boy, this next one's super annoying. I already had to play against <laughs> it twice. TBS. It's Tezzeret Artifice Master. Oh my god, this card's nasty. It's three blue blue for a five loyalty planeswalker with plus one. You get a one one flying Thopter spirit or Thopter token, artifact creature token. So six loyalty and you have a one one flyer. Zero to draw a card. And if you control three or more artifacts, draw two cards (laughs) instead. Tezzeret makes artifacts. This is insane. And then the emblem is minus nine. You get an emblem with at the beginning of your end step, search your library for a permanent card, put it onto the battlefield, and then shuffle your library. This card is robusto. Stupid card. I got summarily smashed by it every time I saw it. Yeah, this this card is good at 
everything except ultimating. I think you'd never actually ultimate this card. The the, the abilities mm -hmm. of the card themselves is, is, are too good. Um, you know, has one of the you know key things that you look for in a planeswalker: an ability to protect itself uh, with its plus ability. And you know, if if your opponent can't kill your thought, there's I mean that zero ability is also going to bury very quickly too. So I, I mean, this card is. I, I, I'd be hard pressed to, to, to say it's like any worse than an A, and kind of like is on the borderline for A plus. Yeah, I'll just say A plus for Tezzeret Artifice Master. I, 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 my assumption is this is going to end up being one of the most powerful cards in the yeah. set. So <sighs> that card's so good. <laughs> I want to open one. Uh, next and last blue card is Wind Reader Sphinx. It is five blue blue for a three seven flying Sphinx. I like that. Uh, I know it's a weird stat line, but 3-7 uh, is actually extremely difficult to kill, uh, both in combat and even with some of the removal in the set. And then when you see what it actually does, you're like, oh, that makes even more sense. Whenever a creature with flying attacks, and of course, when Reader Sphinx has flying, you may draw a card. And so, boom, you start just piling up cards as you attack. You can play Wind Reader Sphinx in your first main phase, then attack with a flyer and draw a card. If Wind Reader Sphinx is your only flyer, you can just attack with it and start drawing cards. It's very difficult for your opponent to pile up seven power worth of flyers to block a Wind Reader Sphinx. So I'm a big fan, um, but the seven mana is very real. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, there's not a lot to say more than what you've said. Um, uh I don't think the amount of flyers changes too much. I mean, obviously you've got to have a couple, but I I, I, do, I do don't think it's like oh I don't have enough flyers to play this card. That's why I, that's why I wouldn't drop it. It's good by yeah. itself. No, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, you do not. It is not a build around in that way. The only consideration is can you reliably yeah. cast. Wind Reader Sphinx. So just keep that in mind. Um, but otherwise, I like it at, at like a B or a B plus. I mean, I, I really legit think the card's very good. It blocks everything and it can uh, draw you a bunch of cards in the late game uh, to help yeah, you win. I, so, yeah, I, I think B I like plus. It. What, what grade do you like for, for this? Sphinx? Yeah, B plus is for okay, me. Too. B plus for Wind Reader Sphinx. Uh, that br brings us to black, our last color. Then we've got a few gold cards, a couple of artifacts, and then that's all she wrote. Uh, Bone Dragon is our first black card. This is our mythic rare here, uh, the non-Planeswalker mythic rare. Three black black for a 5-4 flying dragon skeleton. Probably the scariest thing I could imagine. Activated ability. Three black black, exile seven other cards from your graveyard. Return bone dragon from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. So, no hmm. test wise, it's pretty good. Like, it's not like the most amazing, but it's you know, a good B, B to B plus range for vanilla test. Actually, no, it's probably B plus. Yep. We're very solidly B plus because you usually get a full four flyer. Um, yeah. The, the ability, you know, in long games will happen once maybe. Um, and it's not nothing. I mean, it, it you know, absolutely brings back uh, the creature. Remember, it's itself doesn't count as one of the seven cards you exile. So you need kind of eight cards in your graveyard to, to trigger this ability. Um, I wouldn't try and... Which is a lot. It's a, it's a lot. Uh, but, but but uh, you know, I, I, I can see some games that this is actually going to be super annoying because I've just killed this B plus flyer and then I've got to kill it again. And most of the time, I'm just not going to have enough ammunition to be able to do that twice. So... I think this is an A minus, but it's a barely an A minus because it's not the, the ability isn't like it doesn't happen every game and it only happens if your opponent happens to kill this thing the first time. Yeah, I, I think the way I would put it is it's an A minus for efficiency reasons, not for raw power. This is a powerful card, but this isn't the type of mythic where you're, you know, like we just talked about Tezzeret. You play against Tezzeret, you feel completely helpless. You're just like sitting there waiting to die. Bone Dragon is just really good 5-4 flyer, but it's not the kind of card that just dominates the board. I mean, it dies to Electrify. Like, it, it dies to a common. Like, you can kill it pretty easily. So I like A-0 for Bone Dragon. It is just annoying enough. But don't underestimate. Seven cards in addition to the Bone Dragon is a lot. Yeah. Like, that is not happen no. that often. So it has to be a really drawn-out game. Uh, next is Death Baron, one black black for a 2-2 zombie wizard. And uh, skeletons, <laughs> including our friend Bone Dragon, and other zombies you control get plus one, plus one, and have Death Touch. It's a 2-2. Yeah, I actually think this card is actually 
has pretty good context in this set. There's a reasonable amount of um, zombies and skeletons. Um, so plus one, plus one happens. I think Death Touch is actually really useful in, in black because a lot of its cards like stall. And, but, you know, like a reassemb reassembling skeleton, you know, if it's actually taking down a creature every time um, your opponent attacks, that's, that's obviously a huge, uh, huge boon. Um, I will say also uh, the skeleton archer um, actually becomes a removal spell like a, with this ability because um, the, the archer itself gets death touch, which means that the one damage um, that it does when it comes into play actually kills a creature. So that's actually something relevant too. Oh, you mean the one, the, yeah, 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 the, the black one, right? Not, not yeah. the poison tip archer, but the other guy. Oh, yeah, that's kind of cool. Yeah, it's the four mana 3-3, three, three, um, you know, it does one damage when it comes into play, which is already a pretty good card, but with Death Baron it actually becomes just a pure removal spell. Yeah, we both like the artwork on that one too, right? The, yep, the, 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 the one. skeleton archer? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and it's not so far below the vanilla test that we're crying about it, though it's probably does need to be doing something else for what we're, I mean, one black, black for a two, two. I'm not playing that, you know, yep. just on its own. Um, what kind of grade? I think this is like a C plus B minus depending yeah, on like, me too. If, 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 if I, I, I agree with you, I almost wouldn't play it if I didn't have at least one or two um, cards that were skeletons or zombies, but um, you know, it, if you do have that, then I think it meets, meets the grade of actually playing it. Okay. C plus B minus for Death Baron. Next is Demon of Catastrophes. Two black black for a six six flying trample. That's right, six six with flample. Except for you got to be wondering right now if you've been listening to LR for a while, you're going to go. Hold on a second. I don't get six six flying trample for four. What do I got to pay? What you have to pay is a creature. As an additional cost to cast this spell, sacrifice a creature. Okay. Hmm. I mean, it's a good I payoff. can pay that. Yeah, it's a good payoff. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. even like the the good thing is there's actually quite a few uh, commons that uh, you can play to, you know, to pay his cost fairly easily. Reassembly ske uh, skeleton, he's uncommon, but um, Doom Dissenter mm -hmm. is another one that's like you know already in black. And then if you actually go to like white or red, there's a bunch of token makers that actually you know do this quite efficiently yeah and so six, six and this is a huge threat i mean yeah. man i mean it's bigger than anything um at four mana that flies so and and you know that's going to close the game in like two to three turns after of, of attacking so i think this card is actually pr like an a minus mainly because i, I of this the the kind of fear it puts in your, your opponent if you cast it on turn four okay i i was going to give it a b um, because of the cost, like it is real. You might be closer to right though. Like do, <laughs> there's not that much removal that kills this and it must be removed. And if you cast it on turn four, you have created a massive situation for your opponent. Like again, well worth the risk. Yeah. I, I would actually uh, always, we'll, we'll see how it plays out. I, I, I think I would nearly always play it on turn four, even if I just have to suck a bear. Like I, I actually think it's that. just a real creature, it's a, re mm -hmm. a real okay. creature. And don't get me wrong. Yeah. It's 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 kind of like putting a, a a big aura onto it, but you know it's 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 an aura is fine. I mean, you know, like a, a an aura on a bear that's like plus four plus four and flying and trample. I think that's a pretty good uh, aura. Yeah, for four mana. Yeah. yeah, we would be playing that. So there you go. <laughs> uh, so I say B. You say A minus for Demon of Catastrophes. Next is Frain Omnipotence. It is three black black for a sorcery at rare. Each player loses half their life then discards half the cards in their hand, then sacrifices half the creatures they control, you round up each time. Uh, I, no. I think this is not going to be good, really. I mean, there's some weird ap applications. If your opponent only has one creature, they're forced to sacrifice that creature. Um, yeah. But in general, I mean, five minutes is quite a lot to, to ask for this card. Uh it's yes. Yeah, it just doesn't do the right stuff for uh, at the right time. I mean, the 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 baseline take on frame omnipotence is that it's awful, right? Like the, the the cost being, of course, that you are the one who has to pay a card, and you are the one that has to pay the mana for this thing that's going to happen to both. So, what you need to be able to do is reliably set up a situation where it's heavily skewed in your favor. I mean, remember, you're in debt. You're five mana and a card down. You have to make that back just to break even. 
then you have to get even more value out of it to, in order to turn a profit as, as we would say. Yeah. I, in limited, like how are you doing that? How, how are you possibly setting up consistent board states where your opponent's losing more life? And that's not even the important part, but more cards, more, uh, you know, creatures away than you are. It's just, I don't really see how you could consistently set that up. So I, I would give Fran omnipotence an F. I just don't think you're going to be playing it. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. Um, just a note to uh, the people who like to play uh, two-headed giant. Um, there's a little bit of a rules weirdness with this card. Because uh, it's each player loses half their life and there's two players on a team, you actually instantly draw any two-headed giant game, like instantly. Like the game just ends, it's a draw, and then you have to start another game. <laughs> what? It, 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 this was like happening all over the pre-releases. When you cast this card into a giant, the game just ends and then you've got to start another game to decide who wins. Are you match. serious? Yeah, it does. <laughs> Uh, they it's might just change banned. It. Yeah, I mean, you <laughs> yeah, might have to change. You might have to. They might change the rules, uh, like because I don't think that was intended. But as it reads right now, it actually just ends any two headed giant game as a draw. That is hilarious. <laughs> All right. Well, hopefully, people won't be playing it. Um, next is, I guess, me in the morning. Graveyard <laughs> Marshal. <laughs> it's a uh, black black for a three two zombie soldier. And uh, it's rare, and it has active. So first off, black black for a three two. Um, okay, sure. Uh, it has two and a black exile a creature card from your graveyard. Create a tapped two two black zombie creature token. Ooh, I like that. Yeah, this is this is kind of like a a one guy army here. So I th I, th I actually think you know for the most part, you know, it doesn't really ask too much of you. Two black is a, a a bit much on turn two, but you don't have to cast it on turn two, obviously. Uh, but it is mm -hmm. it pays off very well. It's a three two, um, and if you have like one or two creatures in your graveyard, that's that's instantly enough for this to be good. Yeah, I I like it. I just I, I get the, I love I really feel like they hit a nice stride with some of these rares that aren't busted. Like this is just good. You know, the one that draws you the cards. Like it's very fragile. Uh, you know, the mystic. Uh, archaeologist right these are these are cards that feel more like uncommons a little bit but that are really good you know and graveyard marshal is one of them so i mean i like it as a b like i just think this is if you're playing black you want this card it's in your colors you're doing it and you're hoping to get a little value uh from the uh ability you know that's kind of the focal point of graveyard marshal so i like it at b what do you have it at yeah, I, I think B is, is – is, if, if it actually costs like a little bit easier to cast, I think I would probably have it higher, but I think B is right where I have it. All right. Infernal Reckoning is next. It's black for an instant exile target colorless creature. You gain life equal to its power. And you'll note that the demon on there is holding an Eldrazi in its hand, a subtle <laughs> note to perhaps to what people had in mind when they designed this. Uh, I can't, I mean, this is a sideboard card, but even then I would give it a low sideboard grade. I, I mean, are you really bringing this in if you see some artifact creature, you know, no. they, they, they no. have a gearsmith guardian or, or a field creeper and you're like, you know, diamond mare, you're just running to your sideboard for infernal reckoning. I feel like probably not. No, I actually think this is uh, an F. I don't think any of the artifact creatures that I know of in this set are worth bringing this in for. You know what I'd be really happy is if my opponent killed my uh, my uh, sky scanner with it. I would be like, sweet. <laughs> uh, all right, F for Infernal Reckoning. Next is um, Isareth the Awakener. And she's one black black for a 3-3 three, three human wizard. She's legendary at rare. She's got death touch. So let's – there's a lot of text here, but let's just take a quick pause there. So three mana, 3-3 three, three death touch for three at legendary. Sure, right? That's yeah. a good card. Yeah, that's a yeah. B. Good on defense, good on offense. It's a B. So whenever she attacks, you may pay X. When you do, return target creature card with converted mana cost X from your graveyard to the battlefield with a corpse counter on it. If that creature would leave the battlefield, exile it instead of putting it anywhere. Holy crap. This card is busted. You um, just get to get creatures back whenever she attacks? Yeah, and, and usually a, 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 like a, a creature like this, the, the, the creatures that she makes is tied to her living. But if Isareth dies, you still get to keep the thing you return. So, I mean, like if she somehow survives the first first time, I can't imagine that you lose the game very often. 
because agreed. And and what's your worst case? Like she has to trade off for something. They they can't just let her keep attacking. And even then, you got a two. You you, you traded on the ground and got a creature back, so you're up a card. Yeah. No. No. I I, I think this card is Ooh. excellent. And I'm I'm trying to think if it's it makes it a little uh, like better than a minus for me. I think. A minus is where I'm going to land, but only because there is like a little bit of a time window where your opponent can just like remove it, um, mm-hmm. and it's not that big a creature. That being said, uh, and and you need to set it up a little bit. You got to have a creature in the graveyard. So sure, but it's okay. It's, it's, it's an A minus, but it's but it's a powerful A minus, like really creepy yeah. up on A here. Super efficient, Isareth the Awakener, A minus. Next is a little disappointing, maybe Liliana, untouched by death. Two black, black planeswalker, four loyalty, uh, mythic rare, of course, plus one. Put the top three cards of your library into your graveyard. If at least one of them is a zombie card, each opponent loses two life and you gain two life. Okay, but if there's not a zombie card, then you just milled yourself for three. All right, so next is minus two. Target creature gets minus X, minus X on a turn, where X is the number of zombies you control. All right, minus three. (laughs) Another, so this is an ultimate that you can do right when you cast her. You may cast zombie cards from your graveyard this turn. (laughs) She really Uh, likes zombies. (laughs) I'm feeling a sub-theme here for Liliana, and I'm not really liking it. Um Look, if you don't have – is this even playable? Like I'm honestly wondering if I just don't even want this card in my deck. Like even if I have like two or three zombies, so what? I don't. I still don't want Liliana, do I? No, I don't think so. I, I mean if, if I was like you know realistically trying to think about how many zombies I, I, I think I need for this card to be worth playing, it, it hit something like seven, eight, and even then it yeah. would be kind of like medium – to medium bad. So I think this card is, you know, a build around D and that's, that's a really, really generous wow. build it's, around D for Liliana. And the only reason we're doing that is so we don't have to give our first F <laughs> <laughs> build around D for Liliana untouched by death. That sucks. I mean, cool for zombie fans and maybe for constructed, but that is not a good card in limited. Uh, next is Liliana's contract three black, black for an enchantment. Uh, when Liliana's contract enters the battlefield, draw four cards and you lose four life. I'm in. I'll sign that contract. Next is uh, at the beginning of your upkeep, if you control four or more demons with different <laughs> names, you win the game. Okay. Uh, no on that part. But the first part I'm in on, the first part I, I do like quite a bit. Yeah. I mean, the second part, I don't think is even possible in this set. Um the first part, I think it's it's solid. I mean, it, it, it's one of those things where if this, I mean, if if you had a a blue card that was like draw three cards and doesn't lose a life, that card is better than this, I think overall, just because I, I think there's you know obviously some situations where you're either very close to death or you're under like four or under. Um, that you can't even cast this. So just because there's a couple situations, I feel this card is probably just a C plus. I mean, by raw card advantage is obviously really, really good, but I think there are going to be some situations and sometimes you can't even like cast all the cards because you happen to lose all that life. Yeah, that's true. So what do you want to give Lily on his contract? C plus. I, 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 it's, it's actually, okay. I, it, it's, it's solid, um, but not, uh, it's not amazing, and I don't think I would take it super early. Yeah, the fact that you sometimes just can't cast it is a major drawback. Also, there's one demon in the set. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> demon of catastrophe. So, yeah, you're not winning that way. Okay. Uh, next is open the graves, three black, black for an enchantment at rare. Whenever a non token creature you control dies, you get a 2 2 black zombie creature token. The text box is good, the casting cost is not. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, like if if this costs mm. like four, even or I mean, optimally three, this card would actually be, you know, like looking at a little bit of a maybe a, a B range. I, I don't, I don't even know if, if that'd be the case. But at five mana, this becomes like, you know, this is a D plus C minus card and pr- probably generous at that. Yeah, I am. I think I'm just off of open the graves. Yeah, I mean, it, it it's not. 
I, I, I could see there are going to be some board states and some stalls that this, this card might actually do something. But in general, I think we, we, we need to tell people to avoid it. Yeah. Okay. So let's just say, how, how low do you want to go? I want to go for a D plus. Can I go for F plus? Uh, I think it's more play. If you want to go to D minus, I'll. F plus, I'll, is the, F plus by the way, is the most insulting grade you've ever <laughs> I. Okay. <laughs> I, I actually think F plus is actually. Eh, um, okay. How about F? F? F. Let's just go to F. This card is pretty bad. We'll go. We'll go from the lowest point F plus up to F for open grade. I just don't <laughs> think you're going to be casting it. Like, uh, last black card is Phylactery Lich. Black, black, black for a 5-5 five, five zombie that's indestructible at rare. When it enters a battlefield, you put a phylactery counter on target, or excuse me, on an artifact you control. Now, when you control no permanents with phylactery counters on them, you sacrifice phylactery lich. So the key here, though, the, the sort of subtext here is that you need to have an artifact on the battlefield. Yeah. In order to keep the lich around. I mean, what's weird about this card in the set is that uh, blue white is the artifact uh, color, and this is a black card. Mm -hmm. And not only is it yeah, a black why card, is it here? I mean, it, it's there because there's an artifact theme, but th triple black means it can't even be splashed or f like find its way into the main artifact deck, which generally means that, f I mean, this card is going to be, you know, it, it, it's essentially an F because the situations never come up. But if you happen to have, let's say, a blue black um, artifact deck, and you also happen to be playing, oh, you know, nine to ten swamps, you can kind of consider it. But it it's so rare that I kind of want to steer people away from it and put like an F on it. I do too. I just, the the, mana, the combination of mana cost plus setup cost, and what do you get for it? A five, five, well, a 5-5 five, five Indestructible is good. It is good. Like, it's just that you never get that turn three. Yeah, it's not meant to be. It, you know when it's best. yeah, it's 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 way way too hard. I mean, I, again, I you know apart from like a few outlier decks that you'll know when you see it, this card should be an F, and you should be steering away from drafting it. Yeah. By the way, a disperse really messes up this whole plan pretty nicely. <laughs> okay, uh, we've got a few gold cards here, and then uh, and then it looks like there's a couple of like maybe four or five artifacts and uh, one land, and then that's it. So this first one is, how do you say, do you say Arcades or Arcades? I, I, I've traditionally said Arcades. That. Don't, uh -huh. <laughs> like, no, it's Arcades. Don't say Arcades. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it's Arcades, <laughs> though, you know, I would like to, you know, maybe play some Donkey Kong with this guy. <laughs> okay. Okay. And would you say the strategist or the strategist? Uh, the strategist. I think strategist makes makes you sound a little bit pretentious. <laughs> Arcades the strategist Arcades is, is one strategist. <laughs> Arcades the strategist is one green, blue, white for a legendary creature, Elder Dragon, and we've got a, a cycle of these. Um, this is the Bant one. Uh, it's a three-five flying vigilance Elder Dragon at Mythic. These are all Mythic. Whenever a creature with Defender enters the battlefield under your control, draw a card. No. Uh, each creature you control with Defender assigns combat damage equal to its toughness rather than its power and can attack as though it didn't have Defender. So, look, when I read this, under most circumstances, I'm reading it as four color or three color, four mana, three five flying vigilance. Yeah, I mean, it's it's more like a five five just because of a second ability. So, um, good point. Good point. Yeah, yeah. That's oh, what actually, I meant to say. So, five five effect. Oh, actually, no, no. Sorry. Um, only defense. Is, is it, it doesn't affect it itself. It does not affect itself. I, I was. Yeah. So you're right. It's a three five. Um, you, you know what it should say? It should. It should have defender. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> and then take defender off of itself. <laughs> it's a little redundant. I, I, but... <laughs> I, I, I do wish it actually said defender. I mean, I, like it kind of. It's 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 a bit weird. Um, there's not a there's a, there's a few cards with defender, but not enough. Um. I just wanted to have a quick note about all these three color um, ones. I I would mm -hmm. generally not take these early in a draft, even though that's very, very tempting and they're very powerful. I think it's actually really hard in this set to consistently get three colors and be happy about it. Um, that being said, there's a couple ways. There's, there's um, Gift of Paradise and there's... Um, uh, manolith that help it a little bit, but you're probably going to hurt yourself more than help yourself by like locking in this card. Um, 
really early. One, you have to lock yourself into th three colors. Then you have to lock yourself into the specific three colors. I, I just think, you, like, you know, if you if you open it in pack two or three, and you happen to be two of two of them uh, of these colors, I think at that point you can start like considering it. But I wouldn't take this the first the first pick. I, I I just don't think this is one of those sets that allows you to take these early. But I could be wrong. I mean, they are very powerful. But okay. but I I, okay. I I tend to think, uh, and I'm a I'm a greedy player. I love splashing everything. So you know, if you hear me say that, you you you'd probably be um, best to. Um, get yourself too caught up in these Elder Dragons. But back to Arcades, 3-5 uh, um, Vigilant Flyer for 4 mana. It's okay. I mean, it's, it's boring. I wouldn't... I, this, this one seems to be the worst by a lot, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would say this card is like C+. Plus bec and it, I mean, stat-wise it's, it and mana cost, it would be higher, but 3-color um, makes it uh, downgrade a little bit. So I say this card's a C+. Plus. Yeah, I, I agree. I, this isn't the, really the. I want to aim a little higher than Arcade's the strategist. Uh, next is Chromium the Mutable, which is four white, blue, black. So we're talking seven mana here in three colors. This is no joke. But Chromium has flash, can't be countered, has flying, is a seven seven. <laughs> and has the activated ability discard a card until end of turn chromium the mutable becomes a human with base power and toughness one one loses all abilities and gains hex proof it can't be blocked this turn so i think this card is amazing i think it's really good like i mean obviously three colors and everything that i just said but the fact it's got flash means it's also a next snap the first time you cast it. Like, it's going to kill something that, that it blocks when it comes into play. So... Absolutely. And, and then it, then you have a seven and fly that just cleans up the game. So when you put all those together, this is well worth the investment. And also being flash, it just means that you can kind of, like, you know, sit on it, maybe, like, feign, a, feign an instant. So your opponent's going to, like, probably play into this a lot. Um... Again, if this was not a three-color card, I think this card would be an easy, easy A. I think it's going to be an A- minus to B+, plus just because of three colors. Yeah, I, I'm actually with you. It puts a lot of pressure. The, the, the key here is that it's not just three colors. It's three non-green colors. So all of a sudden, Manolith becomes like your your, be, your best way to fix these colors uh, or maybe a dual land or something along those lines. But again, you're talking about seven mana. You are going to want to try to ramp into this to make sure that you can actually cast it during the course of a normal game. I, I, I want to give B plus to Chromium the Mutable because of castability issues. But as a card, it's an A. It's an easy yeah, A. Yeah, I agree. Um, all right, next card is the headliner for the entire set. It's Nickel Bolas the Ravager. This is one and Grixis, so blue, black, and red. Um, for a 4-4 with flying, when, and when it enters the battlefield, each opponent discards a card. So, I mean, these stats are fantastic. 4-4 flyer for four mana. Again, assuming that you can find the fixing. And by the way, worth noting, this is another non-green shard. This is Grixis, so a little tough. But you can also late game pay four blue, black, red to exile Nickel Bullis the Ravager, then return him to the battlefield transformed under his owner's control. You can only do that when you could uh, cast a sorcery. But if you do that, he becomes Nickel Bullis the Arisen, a legendary planeswalker Bullis with seven loyalty and four abilities. The first one is, of course, the best plus two draw two cards. Uh, minus three, Nicol Bolas deals 10 damage to target creature or planeswalker. Minus four, put target creature or planeswalker card from uh, a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. And minus 12, exile all but the bottom card of target player's library. So basically, if you can get Nicol Bolas transformed, I mean, the game's going to end in short order. He can cover any number of bases. He can get you value. He can take care of any problematic permanence. He can get you a threat onto the battlefield. He can do both. Uh, and of course, can easily win the game with those abilities. Doesn't even need the uh, the uh, ultimate. The real question here is is more around mana, right? I mean, I think we're both convinced at the power levels here. Yeah, I mean, I, I was just trying to think. I was doing a little mental exercise whether this is or Chromium is better. I, I actually think Chromium is probably slightly better than this guy, even though the flipped Nickel Bolas is amazing. Just because you know a flipped Nickel Bolas is going to demand. 
is it 11 mana total? Um, that's a lot of mana. Mm -hmm. of, 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 like, and so I generally think that you're, you know, while I think the 4-4 flyer is pretty good too, um, I don't know. It, 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 I, I, I mean, I have nickel bullets way higher than chromium. Really? Like, here's the way I view it. Yeah, best morph ever, right? <laughs> like, obviously the colors are annoying, but like we're talking about on an average game, you are going to get a chance to actually cast Nickel Bolas the Ravager way, way, way more often than you're going to get a chance to cast Chromium. And if you do that, I like your chances. I already like your chances. I don't care about the other side of Nickel Bolas, you, you know, right away. You're making them discard a card and you're getting a 4-4 four, four flyer at some point in the first, you know, X turns of the game. Then you have this looming threat that if you ever get up to seven mana, on your turn, it's just over. Like your opponent just simply cannot win the game anymore. And that's with them already having to deal with a big 4-4 flyer that came out maybe a turn or two earlier than you'd expect that to happen. So for me, I, I place a lot of utility on that castability, just the fact that it's four mana versus seven. And then, yeah, sure, great. You know, spend the seven mana later, turn them into Nicol Bolasie Arisen, you win, awesome. But that part is almost secondary to me. Okay, You've convinced me. I think this is, this card's better than Chromium. Um, mm -hmm. I, which, which... I give Nickel Bullets an A, by the oh, way. Really? I'm just on A. Wow. Like, yeah, I just think the power level is so high that you do anything you can to cast the card uh, because it'll just straight up win you the game. And in your absolute worst case scenario, uh, again, assuming that you can cast it at some point, you, you're getting a card out of their hand and then a premium removal spell out of their hand as well to take care of Nickel Bolas. Like, a, you know, a two for one minimum. Okay, I, I'm gonna I'm, worth, worth the risk. Worth the risk. I'm, I'm gonna say a minus, but it's obviously it, it's a minus plus. If you know what I mean, it's it's almost an A. In my, in my I head. do, um, but it it really doesn't matter. I mean, if you happen to be these colors, if you happen to you know have one of the colors, I think it's worth like investing in nickel bolus and and maybe moving into both yeah. colors. All right, I gave nickel bolus an A. Sweet card. Next is Palladium Moors, the Ruiner. This is three red, uh, green, white. So we have the Naya version of these. Flying Vigilance Trample, 6-6. Six, six. So six mana, 6-6, six, six, Flying Vigilance Trample. Palladium Moors, the Ruiner, has Hexproof if it hasn't dealt damage yet. I have... Palladium Moors likes first blood. <laughs> also, I, I just like... I mean, one of the biggest weaknesses of these big creatures is that your opponent's just going to have a chance to kill them. And before you get to do anything, and so Palladium mm -hmm. Wars is going to, you know, to to really just get to, get to attack once or block once before you even get to interact, which means that it generally is going to give you some amount of value before, um, like you know, risking it. So I I think this card, I mean, it's it's just stats for the most part. It's like Flying Vision and Trample. I mean, obviously all those abilities are pretty cool, but um, I think this is an a minus just because I I like my big creatures protecting themselves. Okay. Yeah, I have played of Mors at A. Uh my reasoning is just that we are now in the green in a green shard, so it becomes so much easier to get that third color. Uh if you can play a card, you know, and, and it isn't uncommon, but you can play a gift of paradise or something like that. And then the fact that it's also six mana versus uh, you know, a pretty tough seven from Chromium. Um you know, means that you can also just ramp into it. You know, you can just play a, a whatever, a, a Druid of the Cowl and just, you know, hit a color on a dual land or whatever and boom, turn five Palladium Wars. It's just like, how is your, you know, your opponent can't interact with this meaningfully with other creatures. Now they need that removal spell, but you're going to let Palladium Wars eat a creature before that happens or take six damage or take six life out of them. Vigilance means no racing is possible. This card's just an absolute house, just a sweet bomb. Um, Last uh, uh, Elder Dragon is Vivictus Asmadi, the Dyer. And this is the Jund one. So we're talking three and uh, Jund. So black, red, green. And also uh, six mana for this one as well. Uh, six, six flying. So kind of tame, honestly, compared to some of the others we've seen here. Mm -hmm. um, but when Vivictus Asmadi, the Dyer, attacks, for each player, choose target permanent that player controls. Those players sacrifice those permanents. Each player who sacrificed a permanent this way reveals the top card of their library, then puts it onto the battlefield if it's a permanent card. So that's me and you, yeah. right? Yeah. 
So it's, I mean, obviously the, the stats and, 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 you know, the cost is pretty reasonable. Six, six fly for sixes. We're talking about B plus range, maybe it's like mm-hmm. maybe B because it's three colors, but let's say B plus. Mm-hmm. What this ability allows you to do is turn your lands potentially into something better and turn your best yeah. your opponent's best permanence into something worse. Um, yeah. And so when you think about that, that's a, that's a pretty good ability. I still think it's slightly worse than Palladium Wars um, just, because, just because really the, the, the star of the show is the 6-6. Uh, and so um, Vivictus is just not as good as a 6-6. Um, compared to Palladia Balls. But it's pretty similar. I mean, for me, I, I, you know, if, if you have uh, Palladia as an A, I would say Vice Victus is a slight downgrade, maybe a A minus. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I think so. I, I, that, that hexproof thing from Palladium Wars at the beginning is a very nice. Th- this this wins the game more than Palladium Wars does, right? Because no matter what, you're taking that permanent down. Right, like if they have some big bomb on their side, and you're like, "I'm going to choose that permanent," it is gone. Yep. They are sacrificing it. It's over, you know. So, in even if they get something decent back from it, you are taking their best thing yep. away, no matter what. So the ceiling is actually higher on Vivictus Asmati, I think. But the fact that you always get to get at least something from Palladium Wars means that I, I kind of like that that uh, that safe, warm feeling a little yeah. <laughs> a little better. So A, a minus, A whatever for v- Vivictus Osmati the Dyer. Still awesome. Uh, artifacts. Amulet of Safekeeping is the first one. It's two mana for an artifact at rare. Whenever you become the target of a spell or an ability an opponent controls, counter that spell or ability and lets its controller pays one and creature tokens get minus one, minus zero. So cutting to the chase here, the only thing that I could ever see here is if the creature tokens get minus one, minus zero was super relevant out of your sideboard. Yeah, I mean, this is not good. It's not and I'm digging here. Yeah, buddy. I, th- th- this is an F. It, it's like I, I, there's never enough yeah. like tokens for this to matter. Um, okay, Amulet of Safekeeping gets an F. Next is Chaos Wand. This one's kind of weird. Three mana artifact with four mana and tap to to activate it. Target opponent exiles cards from the top of their library until you, they exile an instant or sorcery card. You may cast that card without paying its mana cost. Then put the exiled cards that weren't cast this way on the bottom in a random order. So basically, it lets you cast your opponent's instant or sorceries, but at a very high premium at three mana to cast, four to activate, so seven mana for the first one, and you don't know which one you're getting when. Yeah. I mean, this is seven seven mana for the first, like for the first ability is just not going to be good enough in most cases. I might board it in if I know my opponent has like a lot of sweet like instants and sorceries that cost, you know, five and six mana maybe four five and six mana but i can't see myself playing this main deck ever no it seems terrible i mean and one of the things you have to remember is when you activate it matters like if you hit a counter spell and there's no spell on the stack it just whiffs you just get nothing literally does nothing if you get a pump spell but it's you know your second main phase well that's not really going to do anything so there there's the timing of it matters for sure but even then you can't make it perfect like you you don't get to choose so yeah. I think Chaos Wand is is absolutely not worth the investment and probably just an F. Um, yeah. Next is Crucible of Worlds. Three mana for an artifact at Mythic Rare. You may play land cards from your graveyard. This effectively should never come up in M19 Limited, though the card is worth a, a, a pretty penny. So if you want to throw it in the old trade binder, then Crucible of Worlds is a good one to pick. But uh, for limited purposes, I'm assuming it's just an F. I, I don't even think there's anything it actually does. Yeah, just an F. Okay. Uh, Desecrated Tomb is next. It's three mana for an artifact at rare. Whenever one or more creature cards leave your graveyard, <laughs> create a 1-1 one, one black bat creature token with flying. Um, so you need ways to exile stuff from your yard, basically, or or return it from your yard to your hand. And you need to do it at a clip where you've done it three times before you're really happy two times before you're like okay i guess i got something out of this Ugh, that is a major setup cost yeah i mean it's got some cool constructed uses but i am pretty sure this card is unplayable in in limited um there's just not enough I I have. yeah uh one one other thing i guess is if you get to remove your uh 
if you shuffle your graveyard into your library, you also trigger this as well. So, um, you know, time twist and okay. stuff like that kind of be, be cool. Yeah, but we've been through most of the set review, and I haven't seen a Delph card yet, so I think <laughs> Desecrated Tube's going to get an F. Boy, by the way, that was four Fs in a row. Yeah, so there's one weird thing about Holy M19. M19 has a lot of constructed-only or sideboard-only cards. They, I, think, I think they were just trying to, you know, get a few more of these cards into formats like modern and standard and they thought this is the best way to do it okay but for us they are forgettable and boy this could lead to some very wildly swingy sealed pools (laughs) (laughs) oh my rares are amulet of safekeeping chaos one crucible of worlds yay money and desecrated tomb uh next is is not an f it's dragon's horde this card's really cool it's three mana for an artifact and i'm gonna skip ahead a little it taps to add one mana of any color so that's pretty cool, right? It's already, uh, what's it called, yeah. Manolith. But it's got a lot of upside. Whenever a dragon enters the battlefield under your control, put a gold counter on Dragon's Horde, and you can tap to remove a gold counter from it to draw a card. So if you have a dragon in your deck, if you're lucky enough to have a dragon, you might be able to draw an extra card. Otherwise, it's just Manolith. So it's just Manolith with upside. Yeah, I mean, if you're lucky enough to get a Dragon's Horde in one of the Elder Dragons, then, you know, obviously it, it helps cast those dragons and gets you an extra card back. So those are yeah. so obviously still, really high. But Rich It's still just a minor bump above Manolith, though, right? Yeah, I agree with that. So it's like a C plus or a C or whatever. One, one half grade or one segment above whatever we gave Manolith. Next is Magistrate's Scepter. It's three mana for an artifact. You can pay four mana and tap it, put it to, charge, to put a charge counter on the scepter. <laughs> so we're spinning our wheels here. We spent seven, seven mana and we haven't done anything. You can tap and remove three charge counters from it to take an extra turn after this one. Um, you seem well, like a smart guy. How much math is that? Or how much mana is that? <laughs> that's 15 mana and four turns. So <laughs> I think there are cheaper ways to get an extra turn. And even if they weren't, I think, you know, even if this was half the price, this would not be worth it. So no. I think um, you should look elsewhere for your extra turns. Try and uh, avoid this, uh, avoid putting this into your deck. F for Magistrate Scepter. I, <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, terrible. Next is Sigiled Sword of Valoran. And uh, this is three mana for, you, you guessed it, an equipment. It's rare. It costs three to equip. So we, we like to do a little check in on equipment. Uh, the casting cost is important, but the equip cost is really important. And this one has pretty high, actually. Three three to cast is fine, but three to equip is, is on the high end. Two and one is where you want to be. So let's see what it does. Equip creature gets plus two, plus oh. I like that. Has vigilance. All right. And is a knight in addition to its other types. Okay. And whenever equip creature attacks, you get a two, two white knight creature token with vigilance that's attacking. Holy crap. Yes, I'm in. Yeah, this card's really good, I think. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it, it, it's obviously on the high end of uh, kind of playable cost for for equipment, but the payoff is excellent. And it, it's, it has a roll-on effect where do you block the knight that gets generated or do you block the, the equip creature? And so, you know, if you end, end up having to block the creature, then they can... Equip the, the the sword into the knight that it got created, and mm-hmm. you know it's it's, it's mm-hmm. just really really hard to stop the value that comes out of this card. So I think this card is actually like a very solid A minus. Um, and you like if you if your opponent casts this, you're going to be really really like annoyed because it's very very hard to kind of come back from a stalemated position with this card. All right, sigiled sword of valor. I'm going to give it a B plus. Uh, but wow, that's. Very powerful, uh, especially colorless. You will see those around. Next is Transmogrifying Wand, which is three mana for an artifact at rare, and it enters the battlefield with three charge counters on it. You can pay one, tap it, and remove a charge counter from it to destroy target creature. Awesome. Yeah. Its controller its, its controller creates a 2-4 white ox creature token, and you can only do this anytime you could uh, act, uh, cast a sorcery. Yeah. Huh. So that's so you're trading. You're ostensibly trying to trade down whatever your opponent's best creature z, times three are for two four white oxen. Yeah, I mean this this is a uh, this sends your opponent's creatures to the school of hot ox. 
<laughs> oh my god! Uh, I want to send you there now. Uh, isn't that New Zealand? Is yeah, that, yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of like school, school of hard ox. Yes. <laughs> um, so, so look, I, I view these type of cards generally as like they're a necessary evil type thing, right? Like you don't want to kill your opponent's creature by giving them another reasonable creature, which is kind of does. But I'll tell you what. If your opponent's sitting there and, you know, th on their turn, they're like, I'll play Chromium or, you know, Vivictus Asmati or whatever. You're really happy you have the opportunity to downgrade it into uh, just an okay creature, right? A 2-4 white ox creature token's just okay. Um, that said, it's not removal. It's not removal, but it does do it to three creatures. So your opponent really mm -hmm. can't, you know, they, they basically have to put like three creatures in play that are like, you know, sorry, they, they can't put three creatures in the play that are better than a two, four uh, grand creature. So, right. so I mean, right. also if you happen to have like a defense set up, two, four, it's just really, really hard to, to punch through your um, defenses. So if you have like a three toughness creature, then, you know, Ox is as good as nothing as well. So I actually think this card is probably is more powerful in practice than it feels because three creatures is a lot of creatures to have to like put into play to, to get around this card. Yeah. So I, I ended up playing this in my second sealed deck and it was pretty good. Actually. Uh, I played a couple of uh, Omen speakers mm -hmm. and they just blocked the stupid yeah. oxen, which is like, yeah, no problem. And I was killing dragons and flyers and, you know, more relevant things. Another thing of course that you should note is you can destroy any creature. So yeah. if you have a, creature that's locked down by an enchantment or one that's just a stupid one one and it's not doing anything or it's just not lining up the way you need to you can upgrade it into an ox yep. you know yep. again these oxen just have a hard time like winning the game or something but it is a situation that could come up also also if you if you have some bounce spells in your deck that turns those bounce spells into removal spells because you can turn them to an ox and then you can yep. bounce the token and then that creature's gone forever so yep. there, there, there's a there's a there's a there's a few uses um, also, if your opponent like auras your um, your, your your creature like a, a pacifism style effect, and then you can actually like turn it into an ox. So there's a, there's just a, so many different yeah. situations that probably add up to a pretty reasonable card. And I think that card is probably on the B minus to B range. Um, probably B. I was going to say yeah, B minus. I think too. B minus is about right there. Okay, so transmogrifying one gets a B minus. Last card is detection tower. It's the only land. And uh, it taps for colorless. It's rare. And it has activated ability. You can pay one mana and tap it. Until end of turn, your opponents and creatures your opponents control with hexproof can uh, can be the targets of spells and abilities you control as if they didn't have hexproof. <laughs> <laughs> so this is funny. So A, uh, I don't even think I would sideboard this in against a hexproof creature, though I guess I'm not 100% sure on that. And I don't think I would. Um, and then B... This is not the way that I wanted Hexproof to be fixed and or go away. <laughs> I think I would play it if my opponent had a Vine Mare okay. because the cost is pretty low. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, obviously, you know, there's probably some mana bases that I don't think, like if I was playing a three-color mana base, I think it's really tough to play a Detection Tower. But if I was playing two colors and I had removal spells and, you know, my opponent had a Vine Mare, I might, like, you know, rejigger my mana such that, like okay. it gives myself at least one more out. Mm -hmm. That being said, this is a very, very low pick and like sideboard card. Um, and so, and it's only a sideboard card for a very specific situation. Right. So, you know, this, this card's like a sideboard D. D. Um, yeah. Yeah. By the way. But I, I probably, uh, yeah, go, go on. No, go ahead. No, I, I, I mean, I would, I think I would board it in. That's, that, that's the, the caveat. It, okay. it, it actually does the thing it's trying to do. Okay, which which is get you out of a situation that a uh, friend of the show, Woodrow, mentioned to me, and uh, one that it, it, this is the only thing I wanted to mention. You know, well, of course, there's more to talk about as the set uh, kind of matures. But he did say that he was able to uh, have a vine mare and then put on uh, ether tunnel <laughs> uh, at the pre-release multiple times and just completely destroy his opponent. He actually had turn three vine mare, turn four ether tunnel. You take six. Yeah. So um, good, clean fun. I, I, 
<laughs> I hope uh, his opponents uh, said nothing but nice things to him all day. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That is going to do it for the rare and mythic rare set review here for Corset 2019. TBS, thanks again for coming on and uh, and helping out with the set reviews. Where can people find you? What are you up to? Where, where can they see you in the uh, in the coming weeks? Yeah, so um, I'm at TBS Dash on Twitter. That's probably the best place to find me. I also just wanted to give a little bit of a shout out. So um, I was actually uh, kind of grateful to be chosen by uh, Brian Kibler to play with him at the uh, Pro Tour, um, the Team Pro Tour that's coming up. Um, so he was able to actually bring uh, two players with him uh, because uh, he was part of the Silver Showcase. I was one of those players. Uh, Jamie Park was the other one of those players. Um, we are doing something to give back to the community um, and kind of the world for actually this opportunity. So we're actually donating 100% of our uh, Pro Tour winnings for this Pro Tour um, to a, a couple of charities, the first of which is the uh, uh, ACLU and the second one is Gamers Helping Gamers which is the scholarship uh, granting um, uh, charity that uh, helps other gamers so um, also uh, Brian is actually uh, like giving he's he's part of the Silver, uh, silver Showcase and mm-hmm. he's getting a guaranteed uh, prize money for that and he's actually giving 100% of that guaranteed prize money um, but he's actually doing it in um, the form of a match so uh, he has a he has a uh, GoFundMe up, and he's actually going to match uh, all the donations uh, that people give to him via that page uh, with prize money that comes from his Silver Showcase uh, uh, prizes. So please go to that. Please uh, give. Um, you know, even if you if you can't afford to give, you know, just uh, send some um, some kind of. Happy, happy thoughts our way, and hopefully we can actually make a lot of money for a lot of good causes. That is so awesome that you guys are doing that. That is really, really cool. Now I'm going to put your Twitter uh, in in the show notes, uh, like I did last week as well. Um, will Will they be able to find a link to those things, the the Kibler thing and that kind of stuff, uh, if they go to your Twitter feed? Yeah, like yeah, really, really easy. It'll it'll be probably like towards the top of that. So okay, um, maybe I'll even actually pin it to the, to my to my Twitter. So okay, um, people can easily find. It. Great, that's perfect. And boy, that is really cool of you guys to do that. And what a fun team too. Like three three really nice dudes. So I know you're going to have a lot of people rooting for you at the Pro Tour, uh, especially now with that news. Uh, it's hard not to, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> so that's really cool. Again, <laughs> thanks for coming on TBS, staying up late. Uh, over in Europe, I know it's it's getting up uh, time for you to hit the hay so you can get up and go to work tomorrow. But uh, we really appreciate your expertise and your time. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, if you want to find me on social media, I'm Marshall underscore LR. You can find everything related to the podcast at lrcast.com. And I mentioned the Patreon at the beginning of the show. You can find a link to that there as well. Uh, or on my Twitter or wherever. Um, that's going to do it for this one. Uh, next week, we're going to be uh, diving into M19 and starting to dissect the set itself and how things have been playing out and what cards we like and which ones went up, which ones went down and all that kind of stuff. We'll see you then. <laughs>